We will commence with the um, Maya declaration session. I ask sincerely for your cooperation, considering we have, immediately after this, we have plenary session four, inclusive green finance, a cornerstone for a more climate resilient financial system. And right after that, we have the three breakout sessions as well, before we can break up for lunch. So uh, we'll get started. We'll move on to the Maya Declaration Commitments. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back from the coffee break. It's time to take a few minutes to affirm the AFI Network's commitments towards the Maya Declaration. Many in the room are already aware of the Maya Declaration. For others, if this is the first time you're hearing about it, the Maya Declaration is a global initiative for responsible and sustainable financial inclusion. It aims to reduce poverty and ensure financial stability for the benefit of all. It is a statement of common principles regarding the development of financial inclusion policy. In 2021, we completed 10 years of Maya. Let us watch a video that will take us through this 10-year journey of the Maya Declaration. The journey of Maya Declaration began in September 2011, when AFI member institutions came together in Mexico's Riviera Maya for the annual Global Policy Forum. There they publicly committed to a global initiative for responsible and sustainable financial inclusion that aims to reduce poverty and ensure financial stability for all. AFI members, representing over 75% of the world's financially excluded, recognize the key role of policy makers in addressing the challenge of financial exclusion. From a modest start, the Maya Declaration has now cemented itself as a core platform for galvanizing domestic momentum and commitment to advance financial inclusion in countries where AFI members are present. Over the following decade, five subsequent accords and two statements have been signed under the Maya Declaration umbrella. These target important financial inclusion priorities of AFI members and complement the Sustainable Development Goals. The Sasana Accord on Measuring Financial Inclusion Impact launched at the 2013 Global Policy Forum in Malaysia. Two years later, the Maputo Accord on MSME Finance launched in Mozambique. In 2016, the launch of the Denarau Action Plan on Gender Inclusive Finance in Fiji put women's financial inclusion and closing the gender gap in financial inclusion in the spotlight. Further on, in 2017, the Sham El Sheikh Accord on Financial Inclusion, Green Finance and Climate Change was endorsed in Egypt. In 2018, the Sochi Accord on Inclusive Fintech was endorsed in Russia to advance development of regulatory or policy interventions in technology-based financial services. In 2019, Kigali's statement on accelerating financial inclusion for disadvantaged groups, leaving no one behind, was endorsed in Rwanda. In 2020, AFI members adopted the statement on post-COVID-19 recovery as the network's commitment to an inclusive and sustainable recovery. In 2021, a decade-long journey. Together, we have come far in this journey, with Maya Declaration changing the global financial inclusion landscape for the better. In 2012, just 25 countries had made 69 targets under the Maya Declaration. Fast forward to 2021, and 82 member institutions in 73 countries have made 885 targets. This accounts for almost 80% of the AFI network. Each is a milestone representing progress that is changing lives and accelerating improvements in crucial thematic areas such as digital financial services, consumer empowerment and market conduct, and national financial inclusion strategies. Combined with other financial inclusion accords and action plans, the Maya Declaration has contributed to AFI members making 800 policy changes, with many of these being the result of Maya Declaration commitments. This contributed to more than 630 million people being brought into the formal financial sector, 
In celebration of these efforts and 10 years of the Maya Declaration, we encourage members to keep making and committing to their pledges. Together, we can build a sustainable, resilient and inclusive future that empowers the embanked to reach their fullest potential and safeguard an inclusive role for future generations. Ladies and gentlemen, in this session, we will be recognizing members that have made a Maya Declaration commitment for the first time in 2022, and to also acknowledge members that have completed targets, made new targets, or reported progress on existing targets during the session. Please join me now in recognizing three AFI members that have made their first ever Maya commitment in 2022. I ask these three countries that as I announce your names, please, wherever you are in the room, we'd ask if you just please stand so we can really acknowledge your efforts and your commitment. The first and the 74th country to commit, we have Bank de Tunisia. Can I ask the representatives? <laughs> have made an ambitious 20 Maya commitments this year. Congratulations. The priority areas for them are policies related to consumer empowerment and market conduct and accelerating digital payments in Tunisia. I would request the delegation again, uh, everyone, to please give them another big round of applause. <laughs> the next and 75th country to commit, we have Central Bank of Iraq. We have it right at the back of the room. Please, let's give a big round of applause. CBI has made six new targets this year with a focus on policy areas of market conduct, electronic payments, and financial inclusion of youth. CBI is also committed to developing a national financial inclusion strategy. Let's congratulate Central Bank of Iraq. And finally, the 76th country to commit, we have the Maldives Monetary Authority, MMA. Congratulations, sir. Thank you so much. Also made six new targets this year. Their commitments are also in areas of digital payments, consumer empowerment, data, and sustainable finance. MMA is also committed to formulating a national financial inclusion strategy in 2023. Let's give them another big round of applause. Congratulations to the three countries that have made commitments. The Maya Declaration platform has grown over the past 10 years, with more than 900 targets being made till date. AFI tracks progress annually to see how the network is progressing. This year, the following members have reported completing targets. The Arab region. The Central Bank of Egypt. Central Bank of Jordan. The Asia region. Bangladesh Bank. Bank Negara Malaysia. From Eastern Europe and Central Asia, the Central Bank of the Russian Federation. <laughs> Latin America and the Caribbean, Central Bank of the Bahamas. Superintendencia de Banco de la Republica Dominicana. Superintendencia de Banco del Ecuador. Banco Central del Paraguay. I apologize. Superintendencia de la Economía Popular y Solidaria de Ecuador. And congratulations again to Banco Central de Paraguay our fifth country that has completed targets, Banco Central de Reserva del El Salvador. From the Pacific region, 
Reserve Bank of Fiji. And the Sub-Saharan Africa. Congratulations. Beseo. Banco de la Republic du Burundi. Bank of Ghana. Banco de Mozambique. National Bank of Rwanda. And congratulations to the Central Bank of Seychelles. And finally, we have over 34 institutions reporting progress and making new targets this year. We acknowledge and recognize all of them. Ladies and gentlemen, please, I draw your attention to the screen as we recognize each of these countries. Let's give them a round of applause. Let's keep that applause going, everybody. Congratulations to all of these countries who have made the commitments and reported progress as well, and those making new um, commitments. Thank you to all regulators and policymakers that continue to pledge to advancing financial inclusion in their jurisdictions by making concrete and clear commitments to the Maya platform. AFI will be publishing its 2022 Maya Progress Report later this month, so please do look out for that. The 2021 report can be accessed through the AFI website. If your institution would like to make a Maya commitment, please contact anyone from the AFI team. Congratulations again to the various financial institutions that have been recognized today for your exceptional work. May your journey continue to be filled with success. Another big round of applause, please. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we will move to our next session. Our next session, of course, is a plenary session. This next session will showcase concrete IGF policy progress and provide the uh, building blocks for further action on IGF and ties into the theme of moving forward together towards a resilient, inclusive, and sustainable future. It is with great pleasure that I invite the moderator for this session, Professor Olayinka David West, Professor Lagos Business School. Please, a big round of applause. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, good morning. It's a pleasure to moderate this session on inclusive green finance a cornerstone for a more resilient financial system. This conversation builds on the IGF video shared yesterday and the Shamil Sheikh Accord on Inclusive Green Finance. Recognizing the risk of climate change to the financial system stability and how these affect already, those already vulnerable populations. The devastation of the monsoon rains in Pakistan are a case in point. Our panel this morning will focus on the green pillar of the conference theme, where select AFI member institutions and partners will showcase concrete IGF policy progress and provide the building blocks for further action on IGF. So ladies and gentlemen, permit me to introduce our panelists as they come up on stage to take their seats. Our first panelist is Superintendent Margarita Hernandez, the Superintendent of Popular and Solidarity Economy of Ecuador. <laughs> Next, we have Assistant, uh, Acting Assistant Governor, George Ewa, from the Bank of Papua New Guinea. <laughs> and then we also have Mr. Mohamed Amire, from the Central Bank of Jordan, as who heads the head of financial stability. <laughs> and
And finally, we have Mr. Paul Weber, who is the Secretariat de Legation, Minister of Foreign and European Affairs, Luxembourg. Okay, so we'll proceed and we we'll hope our colleague from Papua New Guinea will join us. Superintendent Hernandez, I'll start with you. From a global perspective, from both a local and a global perspective, could you describe SEPS's journey on advancing financial inclusion? especially inclusive green finance in the past years. Thank you so much. Good, mo good morning to everyone, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I want to speak in Spanish, please, so I ask you to have your headphones. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. La, la Superintendencia de Economía Popular y Solidaria tiene un compromiso con las finanzas sostenibles por dos razones principales. La primera es que todos quienes estamos comprometidos con el organismo de control creemos que es necesario empezar a trabajar de manera efectiva, sostenida y eficiente para mitigar los efectos negativos del cambio climático. Y la segunda es que la superintendencia que yo lidero controla a las cooperativas de ahorro y crédito y las mutualistas de ahorro y crédito para la vivienda en el Ecuador, entidades que entre sus principios tienen al de la responsabilidad social y ambiental. Esto significa que estas entidades, de manera natural, deben trabajar por gestionar este principio y, por lo tanto, aprovechamos esa sinergia entre la superintendencia y las entidades para lograr resultados. Otro elemento que es fundamental es entender que el Ecuador, aunque es un país pequeño, está entre los 17 países megadiversos del mundo. Y por lo tanto es nuestra responsabilidad cuidar esa, ese legado, esa gestión que nos corresponde respecto de lo que es la responsabilidad de ser uno de esos países megadiversos. Y por eso la superintendencia, viendo no solo la afectación que está teniendo el Ecuador en relación con los efectos adversos del cambio climático, sino también aprovechando estos elementos que acabo de mencionar, ha trabajado activamente para gestionar desde el punto de vista normativo una transformación hacia las finanzas sostenibles. ¿Qué es lo que hemos hecho? Generado una norma que permite a las entidades trabajar efectivamente para gestionar los riesgos ambientales y sociales, norma que se preparó y se lanzó en, con el acompañamiento de la Alianza para la Inclusión Financiera y sus miembros en mayo de este año y que tiene un periodo de implementación de dos años. Y estamos trabajando además, aprovechando una tercera sinergia, y que es que el Ecuador está trabajando desde su gobierno en todo lo que tiene que ver con una gestión sostenible. Tenemos un Ministerio del Ambiente y el Agua que desde hace un año transformó su gestión hacia la sostenibilidad, hacia la transformación ecológica. Y entonces hemos aprovechado también ese elemento para trabajar con este ministerio y empezar a estructurar eh, la, la normativa para poder gestionar adecuadamente además créditos verdes. Y con esto, terminar de cerrar un ecosistema que permita que las cooperativas y las mutualistas trabajen efectivamente por cumplir su principio de responsabilidad y ambiental y de manera directa influyan hacia una gestión financiera más sostenible. Thank you very much, Superintendent. And from what I learned that um, working with AFI is of great importance to you and also just uh, putting together all the different pieces and building the standards around which you can go ahead and implement. So I'll come to our um, host and our host the uh, central bank, which is Jordan. And could you share some of the inclusive um, green finance developments that we're seeing in Jordan at the moment? Uh, thank you so much. I think uh, this session is very important for the time being. And uh, I have met with uh, an expert in 
in this field and uh, he uh, had a very nice statement that uh, the climate has changed. In the past, we are talking about the potential risks and the potential change of climate, but I think now the climate has changed, so we have to move quickly. We have to have uh, very solid and concrete actions and measures to reduce the uh, impact of climate change and the risks of the climate change uh, in order to protect the earth and to protect the financial system. Uh, in Jordan, really, uh, in 2012, uh, we launched a special financing program to support and finance 10 vital economic sectors, including the renewable energy sector. So this sector is uh, really very important and plays a very important role on climate change. Uh, risk management. That's why we paid a uh, lot of attention to this sector. But the actual start of the Central Bank of Jordan was last year. Last year, we conducted a brainstorming session in the Central Bank of Jordan to find the best way of moving ahead, how to deal with the climate change risks, how to enhance green finance. And really, we found that the best way is to develop a comprehensive green finance strategy in collaboration with the banking and financial sector and also in collaboration with our uh, partners from the government and from the private sector. Uh, we started by sending a very comprehensive survey to the banking sector in Jordan to assess the current practices and to explore the potential and the future plans of the banks in this regard. And this survey is considered as a base for developing the, the strategy. After that, we noticed that uh, peer learning and knowledge sharing also uh, have a very important role. That's why we joined the Network for Greening Financial System, NGFS. And also we joined all the work streams of, of this network. Uh, really, uh, we started developing our strategy in collaboration with the World Bank. Uh, we identified uh, the most important milestones that we have to work on. And the strategy will take into consideration two important aspects. The first aspect or the first side is the opportunity side, how to enhance green finance, how to collect investments and funds and direct them towards green projects. And the other side, I think the, the risk side, which is also very important, how to strengthen risk, uh, climate risk management in the banking and financial sector. Uh, how to make sure that our uh, banking and financial sector taking into consideration climate uh, risks into consideration into their business models, into their strategies, into their credit policy, investment policy, uh, the risk management framework, the governance, the risk governance in general. So this is very important, but I think uh, the challenge, not only in Jordan, but also all over the world, is raising awareness. Okay, it is still uh, a new topic for most of the bankers and uh, financial institutions, but I think raising awareness, capacity building programs are very important to uh, move ahead and to enhance uh, and improve green uh, finance. Now, we are working on our uh, green finance strategy. It will be a comprehensive roadmap. Uh, it will help us for greening the financial sector. So greening the financial sector, this is the ultimate objective. Uh, and taking into consideration uh, the milestones. Really, in Jordan, we identified uh, very important milestones that should be uh, focused on during our journey toward uh, uh, enhancing a green finance. Uh, one of the most important pillars, I think, is uh, how to uh, really improve green finance, how to, uh, at the same time, 
change the culture and change the uh, banker's uh, mindset that this area, it's not a luxury. This area is very important and the impact will be uh, harsh on the banking and financial sector. So changing the culture and raising awareness is very important. Enhancing climate risk management also a very important milestone. Uh, taking climate uh, risk considerations in the supervisory approach. This is very important. And when we ask banks and financial institutions to green their activities, we have to start by ourselves. We have to green also our supervisory approach. We have to green uh, either our monetary policy. So these all dimensions will be worked on. And I think we identified a very important enablers in this regard, uh, regarding capacity building and filling the data gaps. I think one of the most important limitations and challenges is how to make the, uh, the data available, how to build a comprehensive database to enhance green finance and to uh, also strengthen climate risk management. Thank you. So this is a brief about our efforts. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. So one thing I've heard is that um, climate literacy is another form of literacy we need to build and adopt in our, in our practices. And also the importance of collaboration, because superintendents also mentioned that, and you've also emphasized the importance of collaboration between the financial institutions, government institutions, and the private sector as well. But I think the most important is it's a journey, and Jordan has just recently started its own journey, and the milestones are there that we will continue to look at and, and, and measure and manage. But also, the, the, another important component is your baselining which is something that you started out to give your guidance as to the directionality in which you're taking this. But thank you very much for sharing those th thoughts and those comments. Thank you. Okay, so I'll go to, Paul, I'll start with you. Thank you. For, well, you're welcome, Assistant, um, Acting Assistant Governor. Thank you very much. Paul, I'll come to you while the Assistant Governor settles. How does the Luxembourg Development Corporation approach IGF? And also, I'll, I'll broaden that a bit and say, considering the broader ecosystem, are there specific lessons that you've learned from Luxembourg regarding, with regard to IGF? Thank you. Well, um, thank you very much. First of all, uh, thank you for having me in today's panel. It's a pleasure to be here sitting uh, next to the distinguished panelists and uh, to hear and learn from you. Um, also, I'm very happy to be able to share Luxembourg's Development Corporation's uh, perspective. On Sorry, inclusive. Paul, can you speak into the... Microphone so we can hear you. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Much better, thank you. I'm not muted. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> I guess I'm trying to say that I'm also happy to share Luxembourg's Development Corporation perspective on inclusive and green finance, uh, which is a topic that is uh, well integrated into our innovative and inclusive finance strategy um, that we have inside of our development corporation. So I think from our point of view, while we all agree that climate change affects all countries, sectors, and people, that they are not all affected in the same way. So as, as with COVID, uh, the most vulnerable to these changes are the poorest and the most marginalized communities, including rural communities. Climate change threatens the world food supply. Climate change deepens poverty. Climate change poses a greater risk to health risks and it may even result in conflict. So we consider the issues around climate change to be complex and wide-ranging, and the relevance of urgency of action to adapt and mitigate are widely accepted. Um, and we believe that inclusive green finance has a key role to play in both in adaptation to and mitigation of climate change and environmental degradation. So strengthening resilience to climate change requires investment at every level either in the country, on the community, or on the household level. And to maximize the effectiveness of the investments, it should be linked to education and awareness building. Um, but there, as very often, there is no one-size-fits-all solution. So it has to be adapted to the, local, to the local needs. And against this backdrop, and considering the vast impact on our societies and economies, maintaining, maintaining high levels of efficient development aid will be essential in the coming years. And as you may know, Luxembourg's development corporation invests 1% of its, of its GNI into, in, into development corporation. 
and it has a tradition of a very principled approach. So we will maintain this policy, and in addition, Luxembourg is also investing into international climate finance and refugee funding, which we do not factor as official development aid. So maybe, and by looking back on the work we've done on, on inclusive finance, we started in the early 19s in the microfinance sector in Luxembourg. Today, Luxembourg is a global leader in inclusive finance, accounting for more than 60% of the microfinance investment vehicle assets under management. Um, I would also like to mention that in uh, 2019, the European Microfinance Award, which is held in Luxembourg every year, was held under the title of uh, Strengthening Resilience to Climate Change. So this has also led to a publication with the title Adapting to a New Normal, which is something that, I've, that we've heard bef before on this stage. So, and indeed, climate change is a new normal, but I would like to add brackets because it shouldn't be normal, right? So the inclusive finance sector has recognized this new normal, and there's a momentum in green finance, which we fully support. Um, I can also say that this commitment is also reflected in our strategy, being it in our innovative inclusive finance strategy, but also in our general strategy, uh, the road to 2030 of the development corporation. So, but I guess, last but not least, environmental sustainability and climate action are transversal priorities for Luxembourg's development corporation. So, which means that they are important for all of our projects and as to support our main objective, which is to, con to contribute to the eradication of extreme poverty and the promotion of economic, social and environmental sustainability. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Paul. So what I'm hearing is that you have a holistic approach to looking at climate and development and focusing on the different areas, the food supply, the health, um, poverty as well as the environment which is uh, working together to ensure that but I think most importantly is the fact that um, context matters so this is not a rubber a copy and paste kind of approach that we can take from country to country and then again emphasizing the importance of um, education and awareness and, and building that across the different um, communities that you're addressing thank you very much Paul so um, acting assistant governor George Thank you very much for joining us. I think um, you have an interesting story to tell from PNG because I think um, you started out with the implementation of your um, inclusive green finance taxonomy um, in the past year. Could you share more on the background of this and why the BPNG has taken to work on this and how do you see it shaping um, the financial sector of PNG? Well, thank you, moderator. <coughs> PNG. Um, in this case, it's quite interesting uh, for small island economies like ourselves. Um, we come from an area, PNG comes from an area in which it uh, has a very large tropical forest, one of the largest in the world. Uh, we have so many other uh, uh, geographical uh, uh, structures which, which, uh, which makes it very vulnerable when it comes to disaster. We do have floods. Um, uh, volcanoes, we have so many other things like uh, floods too. So, um, so in this regard, we, the government, the government has actually lobbied in the international forum about issues of climate change. And that also complements the developments with AFI uh, with respect to the Sheikh, El Sheikh Sham El Sheik declaration for green finance. Uh, the bank decided to approach Global Green Growth Institute, who have been very instrumental in developing green policies in developing economies and middle income countries. Uh, and we engaged them uh, to look at PNG as a case. Uh, because uh, one thing is about disaster, uh, promoting disaster re resilient uh, products, but the other is sustainable, uh, sustainable uh, projects uh, for uh, to prevent deforestation and all that is also considered highly for as a green finance subject. So we engaged them and then uh, New, New Zealand government also came in part and they've decided to sponsor it. And once they, they've sponsored it and we started work uh, last June, last in June 2021. 
and uh, the initial work has been to do with uh, concept node development, and then we move towards uh, the developing the green green taxonomy, and then uh, we did uh, a diagnostic test, and then of course we have the go forward uh, roadmap. So phase one has been actually completed to deal with green finance uh, policy. The second phase of that will be to do with uh, uh, instituting the policy document and make it operational. And that will mean that uh, the bank will establish a center for green finance within uh, the Center for Excellence in Financial Inclusion with, within the Bank of Papua New Guinea. And that will be to, to look at green finance, uh, oper operationalizing the green finance uh, taxonomy. Uh, green finance taxonomy is expected to be a live living document because we're also learning how to do that. So as we go through, we will learn of the challenges that it will present, and then we'll make appropriate changes that's necessary. And then the, uh, the taxonomy and the policy framework will also look at ways of regulating it, promoting it, uh, promoting it and ensuring that it, it continues uh, in terms of uh, promoting sustainable products for uh, inclusive green finance. Some of the issues uh, to do with uh, bankability of, uh, of, of this. Financial institutions are actually uh, private institutions. They're profit motivated and they're not owned by the government or the central bank. So central bank is the regulator. So how do we how do we balance all that? It's a challenge when we come into the space of green finance. The and the uh, Department of Climate Change and Department of Treasury. So this all this all are government approach, as you can see. And the technical team is actually much bigger than the steering committee. So it comprises of some 21 to 20 teams. 20 to 20, 21 teams in the technical work group. And they provide advice to the technical committee. And this is how we've been uh, uh, doing the work. So again, in terms of bankability, where does the regulators fit in? And what is the view and mindset of the financial institutions? Uh, because they also worried about compliance issues in terms of asset quality. So where do they fit in in terms of asset quality? and then they're trying to undertake issues of uh, climate change and disaster uh, resilience. So these are the challenges that we have. As we, as we progress, we will identify what to do. Uh, we are trying to, the government is trying to establish a credit guarantee corporation uh, to reduce some of, to share some of the, underwrite some of the risk of losses of the financial institution to a risk facility kind of a resharing arrangement. So if we can get a resharing arrangement in place, some of non-bankable projects might become bankable, but uh, it only remains to be seen. And then commercial banks, we think they have to make it a, make it a business case if, if they look at it in the long, long term. So if they, if they see it as a business case, we have a good chance of progressing fast in this, in this space. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, the central bank, you know, central bank is more issue concerned with compliance issues. Can we lower the standards? Can we defy Basel standards to, to say that uh, we want to promote green finance? This is also a challenge we have. We are establishing the National Financial Inclusion Strategy 2022-2026. Uh, In the National Financial Inclusion Strategy, amongst all the other objectives that we have, we think of, we are thinking of making the financial institutions to make a commitment, like a Maya declaration, you know, that I commit, that I commit term, so that the, the banks can take a proactive approach in green finance. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. But you're also um, elaborating on the fact of the difficulties and challenges that we're going to hit ahead of the road. And I think Mr. Amaria also said that, you know, climate has changed, but how do we bring and onboard the rest of the communities to ensure that we're all working towards the same goals. But I think another thing you, re you recognize is the importance of working together and moving forward together, having the different and the committees, your steering and your technical committee. But I'll come back again as a follow-on. 
in the process of uh, building your taxonomy, were there any other issues or challenges or lessons that you learned? Because I know that a lot of the colleagues from other central banks are eager to say, okay, that's the first step, because that also came out in the plenary yesterday in terms of um, the post-pandemic and IGF conversations. Any, any specific lessons from the process? Yes, uh, there are obviously a lot of challenges. I, I cannot uh, deny that. We are new in this space, and from some of the experiences that we have explored, in terms of other countries' experiences, some countries have over 900 pages of taxonomy. Uh, and so it's very complicated. Uh, and some countries, like us, we are thinking of going towards 100 or 150 pages, that would be sufficient. But the thing is, taxonomy is listing all the possible activities that is considered green, that can be undertaken in the space of green finance. So what is our, what is our, you know, what is the best approach we can have? PNG, Papua New Guinea, uh, has a very young, large illiterate population. And financial education will become a really huge task for us to, to bring the concept to the last majority of the populace. Uh, there are government departments that, that are also involved in this. There will be an escalation process of those identified in different economic sectors. So uh, there would be an escalation process and eventually it should come to the Center for Green Finance to uh, 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 screen them, uh, whether they should be passed on for financing or not, if, they, if there's a need for financing. So the Taxonomy is really identifying and trying to manage the flow of funds, both national and donor funds, into the area of green finance. Great, thank you. And also picking up on the importance of data here as well, because you need that data to stimulate the flow and the velocity of funds. So let me come back to you, Superintendent Hernandez, and going back to Ecuador and the experiences from Ecuador. So moving forward, what would be your vision for IGF in a country like Ecuador? Gracias. Yo, yo quisiera hacer notar una cosa a propósito de lo que se ha dicho y que ha sido muy importante para la estrategia de la CEPS en Ecuador. Y es que eh, todos los supervisores y los reguladores tuvimos que superar dos años de pandemia que fueron muy duros para las entidades del sistema financiero. Es decir, todo nuestro esfuerzo tuvo que concentrarse en que los sistemas sobrevivan, salgan de la crisis, que los deudores puedan pagar sus créditos. Pero también esto nos abrió una enorme oportunidad de canalizar los fondos que se empezaron a circular en los sistemas financieros para la reactivación económica de los países hacia gestiones más sostenibles. Y eso fue lo que hicimos en la superintendencia. Empezamos a trabajar con otros actores precisamente para que las estrategias de recuperación económica sean además verdes, inclusivas y generen competitividad. En, en el trabajo que nosotros hemos venido haciendo, lo que buscamos es que se abran estos espacios, por eso trabajamos con el Ministerio de Ambiente, Agua y Transformación Ecológica y con las cooperativas y mutualistas que controlamos, pero también hemos incorporado otros actores, como por ejemplo eh, el Programa de las Naciones Unidas para el Desarrollo, PNUD, o el Banco de Desarrollo de América Latina, CAF, que han impulsado la gestión de recursos precisamente con esta visión de finanzas verdes y sostenibles. Entonces, haber logrado esta sinergia es precisamente la muestra de lo que queremos en nuestros siguientes años que ya la gestión financiera de los intermediarios financieros que nosotros controlamos esté sustentada en este principio de la responsabilidad social y ambiental de manera permanente, no solo coyuntural, que se busquen recursos que permitan que esto sea sostenible en el tiempo, que se estructure el marco normativo para que luego de la implementación, que en el caso del Ecuador está en marcha y tiene dos años para, para seguirse gestionando, se vuelva permanente en función de este principio, pero que además generemos un mercado natural de competencia en el Ecuador en el que la gestión verde sea un indicador adicional al que muestran las entidades en relación con otros procesos que son propios. ¿Qué quiero decir con esto? 
que las entidades se abanderen de lo verde, que se transformen hacia la sostenibilidad de los procesos que realizan y que entonces eso sirva para que se posicionen frente a sus contrapartes naturales, sean socios o clientes. Porque nosotros creemos que en un momento determinado ese socio o cliente tiene que tomar una decisión razonada respecto de a quién le pide un préstamo o a quién le confía sus ahorros. Y si esa decisión razonada tiene un análisis desde lo sostenible, entonces hemos logrado nuestro propósito. Y eso es lo que queremos. Por eso, temas transversales como la educación financiera y la, edu y la eh, inclusión financiera con una visión de sostenibilidad van a permitir marcar esta hoja de ruta a largo plazo. Y para nosotros hay un tema ahí que es fundamental que las entidades lo entiendan. Y es que a largo plazo esto no solo que es lo deseable, sino que además es la tendencia hacia la cual está caminando el mundo. Porque como ya se dijo, el cambio climático no es una expectativa futura, la estamos viendo. Y si no gestionan adecuadamente sus riesgos sociales y ambientales, su gestión financiera va a ser cada vez menos eficiente. Y eso es lo que queremos sembrar en las entidades y eso es lo que esperamos generar, una cultura hacia lo verde. Thank you very much, Superintendent uh, Hernandez. And I think um, what you've highlighted is it's a, gov it's a holistic policy across government, across economic recovery, to ensure that it's inclusive, it's competitive, and it's green. And I think also you're highlighting the fact that we are here now. It's not an end in itself. It's a journey that we continue progressing into and learning as we are doing it, because I don't think anyone has a blueprint as to what the um, IGF is going to look like within their countries, so we're, it's a learning process. So, Mr. Mohamed Amaria, let me just come back to you again. And in terms of Jordan and um, the IGF strategy, how, you know, and I know that you're also working on your um, new financial inclusion, national financial inclusion strategy, how will this be addressed within the, um, how will climate and climate vulnerabilities be addressed within that strategy? Would you share your thoughts on that, please? Thank you. Uh, I think this is a very important issue because uh, the integration between the uh, green finance strategy and the uh, financial inclusion strategy is essential and key element. And when we are talking about uh, inclusive green finance, we are talking about the holistic approach that links uh, environmental sustainability uh, with the financial inclusion. So I think having uh, the two concepts under the umbrella of the inclusive green finance will help a lot on uh, achieving our uh, sustainable uh, development goals. So the coordination between the two uh, strategies and two policies uh, is very important. Uh, one of the most important elements, I think, in the green finance and the financial inclusion is the MSMEs. And I think MSMEs play a very important role in enhancing uh, maybe uh, our uh, greening the economy. At the same time, they need financial services and non-financial services under the financial inclusion strategy. So putting all these efforts together, I think will uh, help us to achieve our uh, national goals. The coordination, how it's a challenge really, how to make the coordination between all th these concepts. That's why the collaboration between the different partners is essential, uh, either on the national level or on the international level. And for example, I have mentioned before that one of the most important challenges is the data availability. So how to, to build the data, how to make it available. This, I think, I think needs a lot of efforts on the national level and the international level. And I think uh, yani the international organization and net networks such as the NGFS and AFI, I think they can play a very important role in making the data more available and in uh, having something standard in order to help the countries uh, reach to, 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 to this level. So I think the financial inclusion strategy will be a big umbrella, will uh, uh, foster and improve the access, usage, and quality of services. And one of the most important financial services that we have to focus on in order to protect our economy and to protect our financial system is the green finance. So 
So this is, will be a main pillar in the financial inclusion strategy. And in the inclusive green finance, I think, is a very uh, comprehensive and holistic approach that could be used in this direction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think I'll just refer to the fact that on Monday at the Working Group's Convergence, this was one of the things we talked about in terms of synergy across the working groups. And what I'm hearing you say is that um, support will be required to um, either include um, green finance in, um, indicators in the M&E toolkit that we have for financial inclusion or, some, or something or the other, but to guide and support the building of a data repository across different countries that would enable enhancing green finance. And I think another thing that is important to note in what you just said is um, the customer segment that is of priority in this sector, which is the MSMEs, which is another important segment that cuts across the financial inclusion space, but also need the greening in, in that aspect as well. So we wish you all the best as you integrate and harmonize these concepts within your two strategies as well. Um, so let me come back to you, Assistant, Acting Assistant Governor George Ewap. What are the next steps in PNG in terms of IGF? Where do you see PNG going on, on this journey? Thank you. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. We have developed the first, in the first place, we have developed a policy document, and we expect to launch that on the 20th of September uh, this month. The next phase is to operationalize it, operationalize the uh, policy document. And that will be looking at uh, updating the taxonomy where it's required, and then to look at areas of uh, inclusive green finance um, that can be, uh, that can be um, uh, uh, that, that the policy has, has identified. And, uh, getting the stakeholders together is another challenge because um, when you when you look at it, uh, there are different sectors: uh, agriculture, the sector, forestry, energy. Uh, all these other sectors uh, will have to come to a central focus. And we've established within that office that we established, we'll have a tech, technical expertise that we will, expert that we will have, and in that uh, we will also have DGI to provide continuous uh, service, uh, uh, consulting work, and, and then um, uh, we will screen all those things in there. But then we, 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 we're looking at trying to promote um, uh, resilient, resilient climate change and climate resilient uh, products that can be, uh, be inclusive overall. Okay, thank, thank you very much. So it's... ...is the fact that it's not a central bank journey in, in itself. It needs other arms of government that are dealing with other facets depending on the, on the topology of your country, in your case forestry, in some other cases it might be desertification, etc. So how do we bring all those arms of government together and sort of Sing out of the same hymn book, as, as, we, call, as we say it in, in English. But I'll yes. come to you, Paul, because I think that's a challenge that yes. everyone is going to be facing in, in, the, in the future and in implementing a lot of their policies. So it's easy to write the policy statement, but now how do we put it to work and get it to work effectively? Do you want to share some thoughts on that? Uh, yes, yes. Um, look, the, there are different economic sectors, and I think the technical working group is very important. Technical group, uh, working group must come from the different sectors uh, that climate change is going to impact on. So if you can have a representation from all of this, we, like I said, we are about 21 uh, uh, organizations in the working group, comprised of both government, non-government, and uh, private entities. So that is providing advice to the uh, steering committee. So a lot of the issues will emanate uh, in the in the working group, and it can be escalated in the process. Great, thank you. And Paul, let me ask you a very difficult question, and you might want to sort of wriggle a bit. 
How do you see your role in supporting IGF policy development in AFI member countries? Well, th th that's a good one. And, and if you don't mind, I would also start by sharing a little bit of the lessons learned we had, because this is also one of a journey that we did on our side. Um, so, I mean, I can say that, that it is an important part of our approach, which I would consider as a dual approach, that, that we are a donor as well as an actor. So I think key part has been for us that we listen to other stakeholders. And when, when it comes to dealing with the complexity of the subject, we understand that promoting exchanging and building on best practices is key. So the challenge we face, we can only face it together. And that's why we have a very much integrated multi-stakeholder approach. And I think also a strong political will to promote sustainable and impact finance is, is necessary. This obviously implies smart regulation, but also joint initiatives that promote innovation and help the sector advance. So I guess we can say that we understand that we not only need to blend finance, we also need to blend expertise. And um, so what we did, or what we're trying to do, is to work with diversity of actors, be it regulators, be it governments, investors, private sector as a whole, standard setters, PA providers, academia, and which allows them, all of them, to contribute with their respecti respective expertise and, uh, and um, resources. So this obviously favors innovation and the establishment of new partnerships. So I guess that's another important part that we have a common goal, a common understanding of the goal to be achieved. And so, and also with this, the regulatory framework can't be underestimated. So when it comes of how I would see the role that Luxembourg's development corporations can support AFI, I can say that Luxembourg uh, as a country has a very strong, strong uh, track record when it comes to green finance, um, but also when it comes to socially and responsible impact finance. Um, Luxembourg has assumed uh, a role in sustainable finance, and which is I mean, among others, that the, we are the largest, we have the largest volume of green assets under management and the largest microfinance investment vehicles in the region. So we're trying to make that ecosystem and expertise available to our partners, partner countries. So our economy is uh, characterized by many different actors um, that are all together provide a vibrant ecosystem and um, in the field of sustainable finance at large. Uh, one of the things that I could mention, for example, is the FinTech ecosystem. And I think uh, one of the examples would be the loft, which is also represented here. Um, I can also say that thanks to a bright, tested, and adaptable toolbox of investment vehicles, um, Luxembourg layered funds uh, and invest in projects that require blended finance um, from both public and the private sector. Um, another example that I would like to make is the, um, is the when it comes to green bonds, for example. Um, we have at the Luxembourg Stock Exchange um, a green section, the, which is specifically dedicated to uh, green, sustainable, and uh, environmental finance. And this has been founded in 2016. And actually, the LGX that raised until today more than 500 billion in green bonds. So, which is also a leading platform in the world when it comes to those specific segments of finance. Um, the Luxembourg government has also established a climate finance accelerator, which is an, a specific accelerator that helps to invest investors to set up in innovation, innov innovative funds um, and instruments. Um, another important part of the work that we do is actually with the University of Luxembourg, especially the other chair of inclusive finance. Um, another partner that I would mention is, uh, for example, CGAP, with which we are strengthening uh, climate resilience and adaptation through finan financial services and knowledge exchange. So I guess when I take a look at the role that we can provide, I, see, I think we can mainly be a facilitator we can be a knowledge sharer, we can provide capacity building, um, 
we can assist in, in creating proper financial services and structures, um, and we can provide guidance for the private sector, and obviously doing policy landscaping. Thank you. Great, thank you, Paul. And I think what I'm hearing is um, we have uh, people who are ahead on the journey that we can look towards and they can share experiences and knowledge and capacity. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to take a pause here and ask our audience for questions to any of our panelists in terms of the experiences they've shared, building the taxonomy at uh, PNG, leading and steering at, um, um, in Luxembourg, and then the Jordan experience, and integrating with other developmental strategies, as well as the Ecuador experiences as well. So we have one, one hand up there, and I see another one over here. I have two. A lady over. The microphone's coming. Just give us a minute. The lady over here. So please introduce yourself and then tell us which of the panelists you would like to answer your question. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Najwa Green Finance of the Central Bank of Morocco. I would like first to thank the panelists. It was very enlightening for me to hear from you. Um, I have two questions. But I That was three questions. <laughs> okay, so we'll start with Superintendent Hernandez in terms of concrete examples building resilience. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So, I um, creo yo que, que un tema muy importante es mostrar los resultados y, y precisamente la superintendencia eh, tiene experiencias en las que ya en el Ecuador, a través de una entidad financiera de segundo piso que presta a las cooperativas que controla las, las CEPs, ha colocado ya 600 millones de dólares en créditos productivos y de vivienda, precisamente eh, relacionados con una gestión más sustentable. Y adicional a esto, 127 millones generados, gestionados perdón, a través del Banco Interamericano de Desarrollo y del Banco eh, de Desarrollo para América Latina, CAF, para créditos productivos bajo la norma de responsabilidad social y ambiental en 47 entidades del sector financiero popular y solidario. Se ha emitido ya eh, un bono verde para impulsar eh, créditos ambientales y, a, y, a, y apoyar proyectos de energía renovable y esto lo que nos muestra es precisamente que ya esta estructura normativa que se conformó va dando frutos en números que nos permiten mostrar que el sector financiero los socios y los clientes ya están pensando en esa sostenibilidad. Pero eh, quiero, quiero aprovechar la pregunta para hacer un, un comentario adicional y, y, y me disculpo por eh, juntar esto con la respuesta, pero no quiero dejar de, de comentar con todos ustedes, de compartir. Finalmente, esta es una comunidad en la que la superintendencia ha trabajado mucho y ha aprendido mucho. 
Y estar aquí para mí fue eh, realmente no solo un cambio de, de cierta visión que yo había estado tal vez atando a unos fines mediatos, sino también lo que yo puedo llamar una epifanía. Estar en un país que tiene una cultura tan importante y que nos ha dejado tantos legados, deja en mí la obligación de dejar un legado. Y si el cambio climático ya nos está mostrando sus efectos negativos, no es una responsabilidad solo con mis hijos y los hijos de mis hijos, sino con todos ustedes. Y ayer cuando yo entendía lo que significa poder garantizar la sostenibilidad en el planeta viendo lo que alguien hizo en piedra hace siglos y saber que es posible que aunque no entendamos o no podamos ver la cara o sepamos el nombre de esa persona, podamos ver su legado, creo que es una responsabilidad de todos nosotros seguir trabajando en esto que no nos etiqueta ni nos hace distintos en nuestra gestión, sino que hace que otros que vienen detrás puedan también trabajar en cosas enormes como las que se trabajan en estos espacios. Así que quería aprovechar para agradecer esto y compartir con ustedes. Yo ayer me atreví a hacer esto que no he hecho nunca en mi vida, yo sé que no es temporal, pero es la muestra de mi compromiso con la sostenibilidad a propósito de estar aquí frente a todos ustedes. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you, Superintendent, and um, I think you've given us all a charge that it's not a choice. We have to do this, and basically we need to leave, we don't need to leave anyone behind in doing mm -hmm. so. So, um, Mr. George, do you want to answer the question on the taxonomy? Yeah, uh, thank you. Um, the taxonomy uh, actually specifies all the possible uh, green finance activities that could be taken across a whole range of economic sector, not just one. So, uh, different, the effectiveness of those sectors will depend on uh, the ability for them to analyze what is green and what could be, could be considered as green and then make submissions for screening to the Center for Inclusive uh, Green Finance with the bank. So then we can connect them to the financial institution. So there will be a screening process because this, this is actually the regulatory process itself, the way of screening uh, green finance submission. Uh, we are looking at both, uh, you know, uh, where, where in the areas of where you can deforest, if people are trying to go in to say under green finance they want to replant and uh, grow new uh, trees, then that could be considered green finance. But at the same time, solar energy is different. There's different areas, but effectiveness of it being considered a green finance depends on the effectiveness of that economic sector. And because the taxonomy is a holistic approach to, to the entire country, and it has to have multi-stakeholders. Like I said, we have 21 uh, members on the uh, technical work group. They're coming from different sectors of the economy. Only the steering committee is reduced to a few. And the steering committee is basically providing the direction. So, so all in all, you know, uh, a lot of a lot of work needs to happen. Financial education, uh, green finance, uh, inclusive green finance education will be very important in this exercise. I think for small economies, you know, uh, looking at a case, if if Papua New Guinea case becomes successful, it will be a good thing to look at the Papua New Guinea case to be implemented in the other countries. Uh, but there are much, much thicker documents that I've been told, which is over, over 900 pages. So coming from which, uh, 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 from different uh, economic backgrounds and structures, Papua like I said, has a large illiterate population. So the smaller the size of the document, the better it is so that people People will like it, and it's easy for them to read. If we make it complicated, it might get the dust in the cabinet. The other thing is, uh, uh, what is principle-based when we are considering green finance? If we have to think about green finance, well, what are the principles that we are trying to look at? Instead of looking at the book and look the prescriptions that's in the taxonomy, 
what should be the principle that we want out of the taxonomy that we have? And that should be a common concern for all of, the, all of us who are practicing uh, inclusive green finance. Should we go by the book or should we have it driven by principle? Thank you very much, Mr. George and Arab. And I think that it's the most important thing is that it's not a one size fits all again. It's multi-sectoral and we have to look at it on the impacts of each sector, of each economic sector in general. So I have a question from the gentleman over there. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Okay. Uh, thank you. Uh, Samar from the Cent Central Bank of Pakistan. Rest assured my question would be short but not simple. Uh, the question is that given the immediate and imminent, imminent threats of climate change, don't the panel think that it's not the time to develop the guidelines, regulations, uh, taxonomy, but rather for the direct actions? What I mean is that uh, don't you think that we should be thinking more about, you see, uh, multilateral, inter-regional, guaranteeing structures for, for green finance, because that's something that, that is coming to face us very, 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 very quickly. Thank you. Thank you. I think this is a general question open to all panelists. So who wants to start? Thank you. Yeah, no, I think it's very important the question is now we have to move quickly and rapidly because there is no time. But at the same time, uh, we have to be cautious and we have to be well prepared because without having uh, all the stakeholders on board, we cannot make actions or measures. So the coordination between all uh, the stakeholders is very important, and we cannot deny that it's okay if the climate has changed, but really the concept is still new, especially when we are talking about the financial sector. That's why financial education and raising awareness is very important, and we have to work in parallel and we have to, to, to take a very quick and rapid measures and actions to reduce the impact. But at the same time, we have to continue financial education and raising awareness and enhance the collaboration and coordination between the different stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you. Superintendent, please go ahead. Gracias. Yo creo que aquí, a propósito de la pregunta, hay un tema que solo los supervisores y los reguladores pueden estructurar y es precisamente el de la colaboración con ciertas instancias eh, internacionales o regionales. El trabajo que se está haciendo, por ejemplo, desde la Superintendencia de Economía Popular y Solidaria ha sido posible precisamente porque lo que hemos hecho es mostrar los datos y voy a referir tres que son básicos. El sector que nosotros controlamos representa un tercio del sistema financiero nacional en el Ecuador, la mayoría de los puntos de atención del sector están en, en eh, espacios geográficos con niveles de ruralidad y de pobreza que superan el 50%, y la población del Ecuador que es socia de las cooperativas y las mutualistas representa el 46% de la población adulta de nuestro país. Esos tres datos fueron suficientes para que organismos internacionales como las Naciones Unidas, la CAF y el BID, vuelvan los ojos hacia el sector que nosotros controlamos para trabajar en estas materias y eso solo lo podía hacer el supervisor porque de una en una las entidades no hubieran podido lograr esto. ¿Y qué significa eso para nosotros? La enorme responsabilidad entonces de que la implementación y el marco normativo favorezcan esta gestión dinámica ya entre las entidades y los multilaterales porque nosotros no podemos entrar ahí. Y por eso además eh, el trabajo conjunto con AFI favoreció que nosotros inclusive podamos sumar otros actores nacionales como el Ministerio de Ambiente, Agua y Transformación Ecológica. Por eso es tan importante que tengamos presente todo este marco, el de los multilaterales, el de los espacios de apoyo de gestión de aprendizaje como AFI y el de las estructuras internas dentro de cada eh, gobierno y dentro de cada estado, porque lo que nos permite eso es canalizar de la mejor manera este esfuerzo hacia los resultados que se esperan. Resultados que además, eh, como ya se dijo, no van a ser inmediatos, pero la necesidad de que empiecen a operar es urgente. Entonces, el único modo de lograr esto de la mejor manera es juntar a todos los que trabajan 
intencionadamente hacia estos fines. Gracias. Thank you, Superintendent. Uh, yes, okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I, I do say, oh, uh, uh, Madam Superintendent's comments, and they have a very good concern. Because when you talk about uh, sustainability, uh, can the uh, local uh, jurisdictions, the, can the jurisdiction themselves uh, undertake such a scheme on their own? And that's, that, that would probably require a multilateral approach rather than the uh, local uh, governments alone. Uh, because, you know, sometimes when we are uh, trying to subsidize something, uh, we are trying to introduce inefficiency in the allocated process allocated process so so um whatever the governments do might be short-lived and it might not work uh, they can do it for one year two years but then if something big happens then they'll give up that they'll attend to uh, economic disasters and forget about uh, climate resilience projects so uh, best thing is to look at it from a multilateral approach like uh, like uh, concern raised by Pakistan and uh, Dr. Margarita, uh, uh, they are very valid concerns, and I think uh, we are all on the same ballpark. Thank you very much. Any other questions from the audience? We have a hand here. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Paul Mendy, uh, Center Bank of the Gambia. I want to uh, say that. Um, Green finance is about really understanding what is happening in the real sector of the economy. And then we in the financial sector collaborate with the real sector in implementing measures that will really address climate change issues. Um, uh, Madam Chair, you referred to the uh, flooding in Pakistan. It's about uh, the extent to which perhaps the financial sector could assist in relocating people from flood-prone areas into other areas of uh, and uh, uh, PNG, you referred to the um, the issue of uh, reforestation. I think that is very critical, particularly for the sub-Saharan Africa, where the, the Sahara Desert is threatening to swallow the whole continent. Uh, so, for me, uh, I think. In, uh, from where I started saying to understand what is happening in the real sector of the economy, uh, I think the issue of reforestation to me is a priority for some of the, the, the countries, and I, PNG, you refer to it. Uh, so my question to the panel is, do you agree that there is need to prioritize, and uh, this is in reference to the uh, point raised by Pakistan, our colleague from Pakistan, do you agree that in the uh, development of a taxonomy, thereafter, there is need to really prioritize and focus on key areas, depending on the peculiarities of our countries, to focus on key areas that must be so urgent that unless you address them, uh, you will be uh, spending time doing stress testing of our financial system to understand the impact on the financial system. But all we are saying is, um, what is happening in the real sector will affect us in the financial sector, and we must really start developing instruments that will help finance the real sector. I, if my understanding is wrong, uh, excuse me for that, but the question is, do you agree that there is need to prioritize at some point what needs to be done? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ewap, I'll let you answer that. Uh, thank you, Paul. Um, uh, you're right. Uh, it's very important that uh, you prioritize uh, because, because you have a limited amount of funds you're always dealing with. The taxonomy specifies all the possible list of activities that can be undertaken. But you, uh, a diagnostic review is also important. Each country uh, should not just depend on the taxonomy, but they should do a diagnostic review of, of the sectors itself where uh, green finance is. And then within the diagnostic review, you can prioritize what should come first and what should come later, depending on the national priorities. Thank you. Thank you very much. And ladies and gentlemen, I will just uh, like to give a warm welcome and thank you. Please, a round of applause for our panelists. Thank you very much.
So in terms of takeaways, I think the, the bottom line is we're already late to the party, and so we need to start working and working very quickly. We need to think about this from a contextual perspective because every, every country is different and the impacts are different. It's not a linear process. We need to be iterative, we need to be dynamic, and we need to think about it from the multilateral perspective. And also, we need to get help and collaborate with others because it's not something that the financial system is going to do alone. And maybe our colleague from Ghana, um, Gambia, was also highlighting the fact that that climate awareness and that climate building and that green finance um, knowledge building, we all need to start getting on board with it because there might not be an economy for us to manage or look after a financial system if we're not paying attention to these things today. But ladies and gentlemen, I think it's also pertinent to mention that the theme of this conference and the conversations we've had today are really to remind us that we need to move forward together. This resilient future that we need to create has to be done collaboratively, has to be done across the sector, so we ensure that we truly, truly leave no one behind. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please also, um, we, we give a big round of applause to our moderator for the session, Professor Olayinka David West, uh, Professor of Lagos Business School. Thank you very much for moderating this session. Also, I draw your attention to the screens. Please don't forget, we need to hear your feedback. We've got our evaluation um, for this plenary session, and that's available for you on the app. Please get onto the app, go to the schedule, add this plenary session so that we can also get your feedback. And then that feedback, the evaluation can be added to it right at the bottom of the screen, as you see there with the arrow, the blue arrow. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I know we're slightly over time and we, we do apologize to the uh, moderators for our next session. We move straight into our breakout sessions. The uh, technical breakout uh, number four, Centering Consumer Needs and Financial Inclusion in a Central Bank Digital Currency Future. That's happening here. Technical breakout five, Financial Health, Definition and Measurement. That's in the Dillman Hall. Technical Breakout 6, Enabling an Impactful Environment for Youth Financial Inclusion, that is in the Gilgamesh Hall. We ask that you make your way to the respective halls for the um, topics or thematic areas that you're interested to participate in. Those again, in here, Centering Consumer Needs and Financial Inclusion in a Central Bank Digital Currency Future, in the Dillman Hall, Financial Health, Definition and Measurement, and in the Gilgamesh Hall, Enabling an Impactful Environment for Youth Financial Inclusion. We'll allow everyone to, to move now to the respective halls. It'll take us a good three minutes so that we can uh, complete the breakout session by one o'clock for lunch, and when we return, the next plenary session. Thank you sincerely for your cooperation. Ladies and gentlemen, we invite you to move to your breakout sessions now. Please, ladies and gentlemen, we ask that you make your way for your breakout sessions. We're going to commence in this room very, very shortly, and I will hand the microphone over to the um, MC and also moderator for this session, who will take over. Please, if we can make our way to our respective breakout sessions, we will start in here within the next three minutes. Those who wish to stay here, this is Centering Consumer Needs and Financial Inclusion in a Central Bank Digital Currency Future. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Hello everyone.
Hi, good morning. Uh, welcome to the next session on CBDC. Please have a seat. I would encourage everyone to move forward uh, so we can have a very interesting conversation. Please move forward and have a seat and we'll be starting in one minute. I kindly request you shut the doors. Please have a seat and move forward so we can start the next session. Ladies and gentlemen, for those who are remaining in here for the Centering Consumer Needs and Financial Inclusion in a Central Bank Digital Currency Future, we ask that you move forward, please. Can you move forward to take up the seats up in front? We thank you sincerely for your cooperation. If we have a smaller group, we might just not need the microphones, but uh, at this time we ask that we move forward. Those who need to move to the other room, we ask that you make your way. I know you appreciate um, that we try to get this started on time. We appreciate your cooperation as well to ensure that we start on time. Please, colleagues, a kind request if we can take up the seats up in the front. This is a request from our session moderators and panelists would like to engage with you. There's a few more seats here in front. Or maybe if we take up the, the middle column so we can be just talking to, to this side of the room, if that's okay. Can we just come in a, a bit closer? Thank you, everybody. Thank you sincerely for your cooperation. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you again. I'll hand it over to uh, the coordinator for this session and we will get started. Thank you everyone and again good afternoon and welcome. Uh, so we'll be proceeding with the next uh, technical breakout, and this is focused on CBDC. So I'll say a few words, uh, introduce the moderator and speakers, and we will kick it off from there. But before I start, once again, I would like to encourage everyone, please, let's be seated. If we can, can we shut the door as well so we minimize the noise? Thank you. Thank you. So once again, dear leaders, guests, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. During this breakout session, which is focused on the innovation team uh, for the GPF, we will be discussing centering consumer needs and financial inclusion in the central bank digital currency future. CBDC has been identified by the AFI network as a priority. And we do hope this technical session will be one of the early interventions by the network to answer any of your pressing questions. To take us further, it is my pleasure to invite to the stage the moderator for this plenary, a distinguished leader, Her Excellency, the Assistant Governor, National Bank of Cambodia, Dr. Cyril Shea. With a round of applause, please. Joining Dr. Shea on the stage are three distinguished and vastly experienced speakers on this specific subject. First, 
Again, with a resounding applause, I am delighted to invite and welcome on stage Mr. Gashan Abu Shibab, the Executive Manager, Oversight and Supervision of the National Payment System at the Central Bank of Jordan. Welcome. Our next speaker is the Head of Banking at the Central Bank of the Bahamas, where she oversees payments operations, foreign investment, domestic debt market activities, and many more. Please join me with an applause as we welcome Cleopatra Davis. And to bring on board industry perspectives and balance to the entire conversation, our next speaker is a seasoned payment specialist, is an executive with more than 15 years experience in issuance, acquiring, sales and business development in the payment space. Please welcome on stage Mr. Mario Macari, Senior Director with Visa. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, allow me now to yield the floor to our esteemed moderator, Dr. Shea, to take us forward with this session. Thank you. Thank you, Adeyemi. And uh, just now, the request to get you moved uh, to the center of the room was in the moderator idea. I think this is just the MC wanted to wake you up a bit as lunchtime is approaching. Um, since this is the first time that I speak, I would like to thank the Central Bank of Jordan for the warm hospitality, AFI uh, for organizing this event, and choose a wonderful place for all of us to, uh, to see and visit. I'm going to start the session uh, with an anecdote that I personally experienced. And that was in uh, 2016 um, at the World Bank and the IMF annual meeting. And as you all know, um, there's usually a lot of um, small workshops and seminars around the meeting. And at one of the meetings, it was organized in, at the lobby of the IMF, which is quite a big uh, gathering. And on the panel, there was um, the managing director of the IMF, so Christine Lagarde was there. There was Mark Carney, at that time was the governor of the Bank of England. Um, there were uh, Wolfgang Schauble, who was at that time the finance minister of Germany, and there was a deputy governor from the People's Bank of China. And moderating the session, uh, was uh, Richard Questy, a famous anchor of CNN. And at, that, at one particular in time, Richard Quest asked uh, Wolfgang Schauble, uh, the finance minister of Germany, what he see, and, and mind you, this is in 2016, what he see as the biggest challenge of Europe in the years to come. And, you know, in 2016, we were having... Well, Greece was grappling with their sovereign debt. There was a concern that there would be spillover into Italy. And at that time, there was also what the media called the Syrian uh, crisis. And 2016 was right, and, and at the, the meeting was right before the uh, US election uh, then. And all of us in the audience expected Wolfgang Schauble to say any one of these concerns. And in fact, what he said, was very interesting, and he said that the challenge for the world, and it's not even for the European Union, the challenge for the world going forward would be the distrust or the lack of trust of the public on every one of you in the room, and this is at the IMF annual meeting, everyone in the room was us central bankers, there were the financial institutions, there were the Ministry of Finance, there was the media, and he said these are the group of people that the public would no longer trust. And indeed, in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, there is a gain of popularity of cryptocurrency. And the reason why cryptocurrency comes about is exactly because people wanted to circumvent the traditional financial system, because people no longer trust the financial system, people no longer trust the public institutions. And so the peer-to-peer -peer exchange of the cryptocurrency then become the it. It's become something that everyone wants to have, not everyone, something that everyone wants to be a part of. 
Now I'm going to ask you this again, just to wake you up. How many of you in the room understand what peer-to-peer -peer mean in the context of blockchain technology? Raise your hand. So I can see you're, you're either not yet wake up, or there's a very few of you. I, I'm going to give you an example why this peer-to-peer -peer exchange is so important. Now imagine now you're sending a, a picture of your favorite pet. Uh, you have a picture of your favorite pet. Only you has it on your device. It's very valuable. If you lose that device, you lose the picture. But with that picture, you can multiply. You can send it to your friends and families, and they will also have them on their devices. And therefore, if you lose your device, it doesn't matter because the photo will be stored in other people. And because of that, the picture is no longer as valuable in your phone, right? You can lose your phone and you can still have it. Now, sending an asset of value through that kind of channel will make it meaningless because then it's no longer valuable. So what blockchain technology and what the peer-to-peer -peer try to do is that if I have a photo and I send it to someone, the system will automatically delete the photo from my devices and only the other person has the photo. And therefore, the, the photo becomes a unique uh, sort of uh, asset. Uh, and you can use it as a currency because it is unique. No one else has it. If I spend it or if I send it, I no longer have it. Somebody else has it. And this is very important. Another important element of the peer-to-peer -peer is that it is irreversible. I can't claim it back. Right? Now you send Telegram or WhatsApp, you can delete it. Right? If you don't want the other person to have it, you can delete it from your device. And, the other, and then the photo in, another, in your, the recipient device would also be deleted. Now with blockchain technology, you can't delete it. When you send it, you send it. And why? Now, now I'm going to go why it is important, and, and, and this will come to the conversation of central bank digital currency. It's because when I send the money to somebody right now, I need to ask my bank. My bank would then call your bank, and your bank then credit your account, right? And the banks, each of them, will get some commission out of it, and it makes transaction uh, very expensive. Now, imagine if your bank and my bank don't have relationship with each other, we have to find a common link. Um, and it can trace all the way, and whoever involved in this one transaction will get a commission. What blockchain or what cryptocurrency try to do is actually to circumvent that. So when I send something to you, we don't need these intermediaries. I send it to you, you will get it. The money in my account will be deleted. When you have it, no one can delete or can block your money. The banks, your bank account, your mobile app based on a bank account, the bank can block your account. But in a cryptocurrency, nobody can. Once it's your device, it's yours. Only you can control it. This is very powerful, right? And then, of course, central banks at that time when it came about, I mean, for me personally, I was a bit perplexed because, you know, we're a central bank, we've got the monopoly of issuing currency, and now suddenly somebody else come and say, hey, I'm going to issue currency too. Um, so at that time, at the, early, at the beginning of the popularity of the bitcoins, many central banks banned it, and then eventually they eased it, and then now it's come back to a stage where they're trying to restrict it again because they see that there are some problems with a cryptocurrency. And I hope you get a bit of, a, of an idea of what peer-to-peer -peer mean. And basically, it's just like I can send you money and you get it right away without intermediaries, without the banks getting involved, right? But the problem with cryptocurrency is anonymity. I don't know who is sending, who is receiving. There's volatility. The price can fluctuate, and there's also latency, meaning that if I send something to you, it can take hours, and so as a mean of payment, it's not convenient. And the reason why it's taking hours, again, this is the beauty of blockchain technology, is that when I send a transaction, when I make a transaction, when I send money to you, it doesn't go through a centralized system. A like centralized system for these people is bad, because centralized system can give rise to corruptions, if you store, say, your title deeds on a, a government-owned uh, a server, someone very naughty can go into the server, change the name, 
come back to you and said, well, the house that you're living right now belongs to me because the government paper said it belongs to me. Right? So this is the concern of these people trying to circumvent all these public institutions. So with blockchain technology, or at least the, what we call the public blockchain, when I send money to you, the information will send out to thousands of servers, and these are random people. And these thousands of servers will then have to validate the transactions to make sure that I actually own the money, or, and the other person is actually the person he said he is. And so because of these thousands of validation that need to be made, it makes transaction very slow. So these three problems uh, is a, a big sort of a deterrent to the development of cryptocurrency. So central bank, here we are knowing something about stability, don't we? Um, our job is about stability, financial stability, price stability. We thought, hey, wait a minute, the CBDC, we can do something about it. We can, do, we can make cryptocurrency stable. We can make cryptocurrency something that people can use to make transaction and cheap because we can circumvent, or maybe not the central bank intention to circumvent, but we can eliminate a lot of intermediaries. And so this is where the, 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 the ideas of CBDC or central bank dig digital currency come about. Um, I'm not going to go any further on the CBDC itself because we have a very uh, important guest speaker, Dr. Uh, Milam Ferris, the governor of the Palestine uh, Monetary Authority, who will set the themes of the topic of our discussion today, which is uh, centering consumer needs and financial inclusion in a central bank digital currency future. Uh, Dr. Ferris, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Good morning or good afternoon to everybody. And thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shia, for the introduction. I am not really experienced like you in uh, digital currencies, uh, but uh, as any governor worldwide, uh, we have interest actually in this uh, subject. Uh, we are exploring in my country as well the issuance of some sort of digital uh, uh, currency. For us, it's not only it's uh, technical, it's not only is, is about uh, financial stability, it's not about uh, uh, only payment, it's also uh, a political issue, but my interest is not really political at all, actually, when I explore uh, this issue, uh, uh, my, uh, my objective, actually, as a governor, actually, to enhance uh, my strategy on e-payment and my strategy also in cashless, since my country actually is based, uh, unfortunately, fully on the culture of, uh, of, uh, of cash, rather than actually electronic uh, payments. So this is actually a note before I start with uh, my speech. Uh, ladies and uh, gentlemen, uh, first of all, uh, I would like to express my sincere uh, pleasure and honor to participate at this event uh, today. I extend my deep appreciation to my friend, His Excellency Dr. Adel Sharkas, uh, for the excellent hospitality, and uh, to my appreciation as well to AFI and the Central Bank of Jordan for the excellent uh, organization. This event is an opportunity for all of us to enhance collaboration on many aspects related to the banking uh, sector and benefit from the sharing of high level expertise as well. With the development of the crypto assets that we witness nowadays, which is not backed by any formal or sovereign uh, financial stability, monetary uh, authority or central bank regulators have taken a pro consumer protection strategy. Financial stability and integrity stands by warning the consumers about investing in crypto assets, mainly due 
to their high volatility, lack of security, and also uh, vulnerability to uh, fraud. However, central bank digital currency is a legal tender in digital form or a fiat digital currency. It meant to develop alternatives to meet consumer demand for safe digital financial services, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic. This is one of the positive of pandemic, actually, that all of us, actually, it, it, the pandemic brought our attention to the importance of digitalization. Therefore, around 65% of central banks worldwide have begun to explore the potential use of sovereign-backed central, ba central bank digital currency. As many studies indicate, the benefit of CBDCs can be seen in increasing the effectiveness, effectiveness and coordination of monetary and financial policies, preserving sovereignty of the national currency, and using this innovation as a catalyst for payment uh, systems. CBDC can produce or, uh, sorry, enhance cross-border payments infrastructure to achieve faster transaction and cut uh, transaction uh, costs. The question is, and I am privileged actually to have all of you, especially Bahamas and also uh, Bank of Niger Central Bank of Nigeria with us uh, uh, to do today. The question is, does CBDC enhance financial inclusion? This is a question. Arguments in favor of BC, uh, CBDC increasing financial inclusions are that CBDC can digitalize value chains. chains. CBDC can enhance access to digital financial services. Transformation the economy into a digitalized one. CBDC can be used offline when there is no uh, uh, internet coverage. It can offer low transaction cost. The argument against CBDC that increasing financial inclusions are high cost of adopting technologies, cyber security uh, threats, a strong preference of cash over digital currency, the burdensome identification and regulatory requirements and might be imposition of high transaction uh, costs. Regardless of these arguments, we learned that one of the main objectives behind the USID, USA adopting CBDC or planning to adopt CBDC project is to address the unbanked people. The Central, Central Bank of Bahamas highlighted that uh, one of the main uh, also objectives that sand dollar benefits or the benefits of sand dollar is the reduction of overall cost of managing uh, uh, cash. As expected, many questions and concerns about CBDC do arise. And in this plenary session, I am optimistic they will be, you will be, as a plenary, do your best to answer and clarify concerns. So, uh, before I yield uh, the floor to our distinguished colleagues uh, on the plenary, please permit me to offer the following guidance for our collective uh, consideration. First, taking forward a CBDC project cannot be done without an objective assessment and review of the existing legal and regulatory framework with a specific focus on identifying the key components of CBDC that is essential and can support financial inclusion. Second, to achieve an inclusive 
inclusive CBDC, we all need to evaluate specific use cases that really help with the financial inclusion goals or objectives. For example, peer to peer uh, uh, payments and government to people uh, payments. Third, why looking into the CBDC, it might be also important to assess the risks and potential negative impacts in terms of financial stability, consumer protection, data privacy, and more. As central banks started evaluating the feasibility of uh, issuing CBDC, either in the short or medium uh, term, we should not aim for CBDC to replace physical money immediately, but rather to offer it as a secure, efficient, and trusted digital alternative. We must update our decision-making process, improving our legal frameworks, and take advantage of future technological innovations uh, to the benefit of in the entire uh, economy. I believe it is important for countries to start thinking about how to link and correlate the CBDC to other existing uh, national strategies and plans. With this, the motivation of issuing CBDC by central banks will vary according to each country's uh, context. In conclusion, I leave you with the following recommendations, if I may. First, we belong, belong to a unique platform, the AFI, AFI network, exchange of knowledge and experiences of other countries very important, such as Nigeria and Bahamas. Second, for AFI countries, my suggestion is for us all to study CBDC issuance cautiously rather than in-house in order to get the desired uh, results. Uh, third, it might be useful if AFI could support the network in their CBDC projects by creating a global sandbox for testing CBDC. This can serve as a shared live testing environment for all uh, participating countries and, uh, and a beneficial experience as they take forward their CBCD, uh, CBDC projects. Thank you, and I wish you a most engaging plenary session, and, th and sorry if I am uh, late. Thank you, uh, Governor Ferris. These are very wise uh, recommendations, and I think just what you said at the end just uh, summarized pretty much what the session is going to be about, so uh, it makes my job a lot more easier. Um, I'm now going to turn to our panelists, uh, first to uh, Gassan from the Central Bank of Jordan. Um, the, the bank is obviously um, exploring the CBDC. Uh, could you share with us what were the challenges that you, uh, what are the challenges that you are trying to solve with this uh, CBDC project? And also, uh, could you share how far along are you at the moment? First of all, uh, thank you to AFI and my colleague from Central Bank of Jordan for this event. Uh, this event is the most important event in uh, terms of financial inclusion. First of all, Central Bank of Jordan, I would like to begin my intervention by ensuring that Central Bank of Jordan, like any international central bank of the world, focusing and monitoring any, uh, any innovation, any new technology related to uh, you know, uh, to banking and financial uh, industry, from uh, digital banking, uh, open banking, uh, using digital distributed ledger technology, or using any technology. Especially when you speak about uh, CBDC, Central Bank of Jordan starting this job by uh, making a specialized uh, committee. Um, uh, the specialized committee is informed by specialized team from Central Bank of Jordan, from the legal department, from the IT, from cybersecurity, 
from all related department in this job. When speaking about uh, CBDC, we must begin starting studying the infrastructure in the country. We need the, the first question, is CBDC is mandatory? Is we need CBDC? What's the problem we want to solve when using CBDC? So the first stage, starting studying the infrastructure in the country, studying the wholesale system, the retail system, studying the infrastructure, electricity, studying the internet in the country to make sure what we need and what the step, start step. So Jordan now in the first step, in the research step, how to uh, the CBDC, what the model we need. We need wholesale or we need retail. What the technology needed? We need technology using distributed ledger technology or centralized technology. What the approach, token base or account base? This is the question and more and more question when we're going to study. We need to ensure that when using any model from central bank, from CBDC, to make sure the, how to deal with the current infrastructure in the Jordan. Uh, the path is uh, still long in this issue, but we must start working with issue. Uh, the study also included some issues related to monetary policy and how to deal with the AML CFP and must be starting with the all law related to currency, starting with the CBDC law, uh, starting with the central bank uh, law, starting with banking law, starting with electron city law. Uh, any regulation must be embedded how to deal with the CBDC. So Jordan now in the first step, we get a technical assistance from uh, International Monetary Fund to deal with this, uh, this issue. The, we're now working in human capability, so how to deal with in the IT, in the cyber security, in the whole issue. We're working with the cooperation with the many central banks and many international to deal with the, and support Jordan in this sphere but we ensure Jordan is follow all technology and in the first step in the research how to deal with the CBDC because CBDC is not a short term, is maybe mid or length term, but we must start and working in this issue. Thank you, uh, Gassan. This is a very uh, important experience sharing and I know that 70% of the AFI members responded to AFI survey that they are exploring CBDC. Um, so I, I hope that all these elements that Gassan uh, mentions about the legal framework, the impacts on the monetary policies, um, and, and AML CFT uh, are also included in, in your uh, exploration study. I would now like to turn to uh, Cleopatra. Cleopatra and I were classmates. Uh, we were at the same uh, diversity and leadership program that was initiated by AFI and uh, curated by Women World Banking. So if any of your institution hasn't sent any of your women leaders to this program, please do so. Uh, it's really uh, beneficial, and that's the reason why we're here. Um, so Cleopatra, the Bahamas is ahead of anyone else. I mean, Sweden has been looking into it forever, and they're still looking into it, haven't decided yet, but the Bahamas just launched it in uh, 2020. Um, and there was a point in time when um, there was a debate whether the National Bank of Cambodia or the Central Bank of Bahamas is the first because we launched our Bakong project a couple of days after you, but the pilot was before. And then I have to say that I bow down to the Bahamas because we're just a payment system using blockchain technology. They are a full-fledged uh, central bank digital currency. Cleopatra, share with us. How does it work, first of all, and what was the adoption uh, so far? Good morning, everyone. So, for the Central Bank of the Bahamas, one of the key drivers for the introduction of the digital currency was financial inclusion. We're a diverse set of islands and with vast geographical locations. And we found ourselves where a lot of, a number of our commercial banks 
it was not feasible for them to continue in some of the islands simply from an operational standpoint. And central banks, particularly with its um, financial modernization initiative, which started in the early 2000s and evolved through various phases, um, recently becoming a member of AFI at the time, we thought, what could we do to bridge the gap? And it was an easy one for our governor when he thought, you know, perhaps we should embark on introducing a digital currency of our own. The project started with the launch of a pilot in one of our islands. And the island was selected because we thought it represented a mini representation of our islands across the Bahamas. It had the level of diversity, the mix of businesses, foreigners, Bahamians, um, public private sectors, so we thought it was a good, a good option. So we, we started that at the end of 2019. At the beginning of 2020, because of Hurricane Dorian and the need to, to bridge a gap almost immediately in one of our hottest hit islands. An unplanned second pilot was introduced in the island of Abaco. We wanted to see how quickly we could mobilize. And it actually taught us a lesson because Abaco had the commercial bank, but they were all destroyed, they were all damaged. And so we had residents that were misplaced, and what do we do? How, do? how do we get them the resources they need? So we thought to move in quickly with a second pilot of CBDC would give us an opportunity to see how, how can this actually work and be effective, and so we moved in there. Obviously, COVID-19 crisis came in March. We had just started that pilot in February, and so it put a, a little bit of pause on, on the pilot, but it also allowed us an opportunity to go in the background, uh, reassess everything that was happening, and figure out how best we can move forward. Since then, some of the lessons that came out, and as mentioned, we did our rollout in October of 2020 of more of a full implementation. Since then, some of the lessons we've learned was that early in the process, it is critical to engage all level of stakeholders, including consumers, because you find that you, you focus on, on the technology, you focus on trying to get where you want to go, but if you don't engage all level of stakeholders early in the process, you find that you may end up with some gaps that you tend to backtrack on. As well, we found that it was important to have a clear and consistent message from start all through the process as you go along. It's essential not to change your messaging. Um, and even if you find that you need to evolve, you also need to be clear about how that evolution is happening. So those are some of the um, early steps in, in our CBDC process. Thank you, uh, Cleopatra. I, there is a deputy governor from the Central Bank of Nigeria is here um, who would like to share her experience of Nigeria journey to uh, um, developing a CBDC. Uh, may I invite you to stand up Thank you. Um, well, okay. Um, so, we're very proud to be the first country in Africa to launch a CBDC. And I believe the first country to launch a retail CBDC. Just like you mentioned, in terms of the kinds of objectives around the cost of cash, 
financial inclusion. We think there are other benefits, particularly around cross-border payments and remittances that CBDCs can allow central banks to achieve. I think our own journey was very similar to yours, but very quick. I think we were very clear that we wanted to bridge the gap, particularly on the consumer side. So we see opportunities for further financial inclusion. If you look at Nigeria, we're very well advanced and very well evolved on payment systems. Yet, I think for all of our innovation, we could do better on financial inclusion. And so we just finished a hackathon because the first phase, we're rolling out in phases. The first phase was around banked individuals being able to load their wallets from bank to wallet and wallet to bank. The second phase is actually the most important one, and that's the one that helps with financial inclusion because we'll now overlay USSD that allows you to use feature phones to do transactions. And what the hackathon brought out was a lot more use cases that we didn't even think about. Of course, we know that you know, CBDCs can help you with you know, government interventions, you know, disbursing loans and all of that. But we saw these interesting ideas around you know, cash to service because we all assume that everyone has a bank account. Everyone that needs a service has a bank account. But that really is not the case. Sometimes people have cash and they do need a service. And so we saw that CBDCs can help achieve that and then help you include people in the financial system. Um, other applications around lifestyle payments, healthcare, and all of that. I agree with your views around the learnings. I think consumer education. So what we're seeing is that, assume that CBDC today is, say, the, mo the fanciest technology or innovation. You still come back to the issues we face in traditional uh, financial inclusion um, initiatives, consumer education, financial literacy, you know, all of these issues around how people use these systems. And we must be careful because we had a conversation about digital mainstreaming that we don't leave people behind when we innovate like this because if you don't have a phone, then it means you may not be able to use some of these services. I think I should stop there for a moment. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deputy Governor, and, and I like the fact that you mentioned about USSD because when we talk about blockchain technology and we talk about central bank digital currency, we imply that everyone has a smartphone, uh, which is not the case because the people that we want to reach out to, the, the underserved people that we want to reach out to, are usually the people who don't have a smartphone, who can't afford a smartphone. And so it's, it's very, um, this is something that at the National Bank of Cambodia we learned as well when we launched our payment system was that we didn't, we, we take into consideration everything except the smartphone uh, part of it because we did a survey and uh, we know that everyone has a phone. We have actually 20 million mobile phone subscription for a population of 16 million. We said, that's it, we're going to use the phone, but we didn't ask. Was it a smartphone or a feature phone? I think that was the big mistake, and thank you for, for, for mentioning this. I'm going to turn back to Visa, and, and I'm glad also, Deputy Governor, you mentioned about cross-border payment. Visa is a payment service provider. Now, if CBDC, if all of us adopt CBDC and CBDC work well, we can do peer-to-peer, -peer. we don't need intermediaries like Visa. So I want to hear your take on this. Is it a threat? your business, or do you think there can be some complementarity or collaborations happening in the future? So first of all, I want to thank you, the panel, AFI and Central Bank of Jordan. And before I jump into the answer, I just want to thank the lady for uh, the comment that she made about, you know, how we can use technology to also bring people into the system responsibly. And I think the World Economic Forum showed that more than 70% of the digitization drive will come, will be, you know, enabled through uh, digital, you know, so the global economy is going to grow through digital. And unfortunately, if we don't develop responsibly, the, the digital uh, divides that exist today are going to even grow further. 
So to, to her point, I believe it's a collective responsibility to drive financial literacy and to make sure that we reach people who are unreachable today. Uh, so thank you a lot for this note. Going back to your question, you know, I, to, to answer it, I think central banks today look at CBDC as a solution or a part of a solution to financial inclusion. And it's, it's not a secret that CBDC is an enormous step in, in the money, in, you know, in the evolution of money. And we all think you know, that CBDC is going to achieve at least two main goals. One is to create a more inclusive economy, allowing you know, everyone to participate in financial markets and commerce. And second, to be a better, uh, to, for, for central banks and governments to be better prepared in critical situations where uh, you know, funds must be dispersed safely, transparently, and efficiently to individuals. And I think this falls in the core of the purpose of Visa. That's why we look at CBDC as something that complements what we do. Why am I saying this? Because our purpose as Visa is to uplift everyone everywhere, to help individuals, economies, countries, merchants to thrive. And by complementing what we are doing today on our network, that is currently serving billions of cardholders and multi-million, if not hundreds of millions of merchants, by bringing this technology on board, we will even help in closing the gap much further. Mario, I'm going to put you on the spot and, uh, and, and uh, ask you another question. Could you give an example, I, and I don't know whether Visa has already collaborated with any central bank, could you give us an example of what sort of collaborations uh, you can have with central banks here in the room who are considering CBDC? So uh, I think Visa has gone a fairly you know, long way in the CBDC discussion with central banks. Uh, we had announced the launch of CBDC Go, which is a proof of concept that, in a nutshell, helps bridging you know, the gap between CBDC systems and the current payment rails that are existent in the world. So if, if, I'm not sure if you're aware that today more than 50 wallets that you, you know, enable CBDC can actually use a Visa card to transact as, at merchants. So I think one of the problems that CBDC has today is acceptance. Because we've done studies, and, and that's very obvious that, you know, people, that what they appreciate about digital currencies in general is security, speed of transaction, universal access, and anonymity. But their biggest problem is acceptance. So we've been able, through CBDC Go and the engagements that we've been doing, to help in bridging the gap. Unfortunately, I think the engagement was not done with central banks in the sense the wallets are you know, working on the bitcoins and the other uh, cryptocurrency, uh, cryptocurrencies. But we have been in discussion with multiple central banks, and we, we're very open to continue this discussion. Thank you. My time is almost up. So I want to give the floor to uh, you in the audience. If you have any question, please, uh, we have someone who can facilitate with a microphone. It's the lady here in the second row. Thank you very much. It's working? You hear me? Okay. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Fadwa from the Central Bank of Morocco. So we have done the same thing as our peers. We uh, start doing some research and study. We have set and identified objectives and see what is the place that we can have for CBDC in our markets. But I have maybe one or two questions. The first one is what is the impact of CBDC on the payment markets, for example? What is the place that we will have for CBDC toward the other means of payment, for example, cards or also for uh, debit transfers or other, other things, and or, or also cash? So if we want to run an impact study, how we can do that? How we can measure uh, the place of CBDC if we don't have the real volume of cash uh, transaction that we have. 
It's, I think, um, a complex exercise, but we have to find a way just to see what is it waiting for uh, the, the next year. The second one is how we can have this uh, position about CBDC. Are we considering CBDC as a complementary to the other means of payment? Or are we going to a substitution of cash by issuing just CBDC at the central bank level? Thank you. Thank you. We're going to collect all the questions from the floor. And I see there's a gentleman here in the third row. Thank you. I'm Philip Van Gruyer from the Bank of Sierra Leone. Um, my question, I actually appreciate what Nigeria, um, Bahamas, and Cambodia have done with regards to CBDC. But my question is, what are the things that, I mean, what level of infrastructure that you need before you move into that? Because we are not that sophisticated where we are. There is some level, like he was talking about acceptance, even when it comes to the mobile money, there's still some challenge in acceptance. And we're looking at financial inclusion, meaning we're not looking at the banks, because for some of the examples, I noticed that you've reached the bank's population. With Nigeria, they've used the USD, USSD to actually reach some unbanked. But what about the unbanked illiterate ones? How do you reach them? So it, cause it's about financial inclusion. It's about those not educated, those not using the system. So I really want to hear how we can reach those people, because that would be my challenge if I want to introduce that in our country. And that is what I would want to see, how we go through that obstacle. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I saw one uh, question I'm there. May I go ahead? I already have a mic in my hand. Oh, OK, please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. My name is Gerard Kutsier from CGAP. And I have only one question, and it's to you, uh, Madam Facilitator, and to the representative from the Bahamas. How can we go about building in consumer protection into CBDC systems from day one? Because our research shows that as digital transactions grow across the world, consumer protection fallout grows even faster. So both to you and to the Bahamas, how can we do that from day one, both in consumer protection? Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, one last question here, and then we'll... Thank you very much and good afternoon. My name is Ismail Adam, uh, Bank of Ghana. Uh, just uh, two quick questions. Uh, and thank you to the panel for that educative uh, presentation. My first question has to do with the CDBC and its implications for uh, monetary policy uh, transmission. So, so how does, given that CDBC will increase rate of circulation, if I should put it that way. What, what is the effect on po monetary policy transmission? That is one. And then the second has to do with how does CDBC interact with existing bank regulations as well as crisis management tools? Thank you very much. Okay, since I'm giving another 10 minute, extend 10 minutes here the, in, the, in the middle, gentlemen. Thank you. Um, Esther Reining here from the Reserve Bank of Fiji. Um, my question is to Cleopatra. I come from um, a country of 300 islands. Many of them don't have mobile networks and it's too expensive to deploy satellite um, connectivity. Um, have there been considerations in the design of CBDCs for off-chain type solutions um, where uh, mobile networks do not exist? In my, uh, in my island in particular, there's a good smartphone penetration, but there's, uh, there's not much connectivity. I have to climb a tree to get, get a decent 2G. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm not sure I hear your question. I have to look offline. Oh, All right. I have to look at the MC if I can take one or two more questions. Um, 
No. One, one question. All right. Thank you. Sabelo uh, Zwane from the Central Bank of Eswatini. Uh, thank you for the uh, insightful presentations thus far and following learnings. The question is to both Bahamas as well as Nigeria. How did you drive adoption once you had introduced it? I've, I've heard a number of challenges regarding the two-tier model and other models of CBDC wherein the central bank starts marketing a product for the first time. So the question goes towards that. And the last one is more of a, just an overall assessment, and maybe we could get a response, is if you were reinventing cash today and we didn't have any paper form that existed, what kind of cash would you like to see now based on this value chain? And I believe it's CBDC. Thank you. Thank you. I am I'm now going to turn to our panelists to uh, take whatever questions that you feel like answering. But I think there's a common so a question across the room is the how do you drive adoption and, and digital literacy? Maybe the Bahamas. Yes. So <clears throat> for adoption, we found that the payment services providers and money transfer businesses, they were a lot more agile than, let's say, a, a traditional brick and mortar bank. We invited all of them to participate as approved financial institutions in the sand dollar um, space at the same time. But we found that because of the nature of their structure and setup, the payment services provider, they were able to move quickly, make decisions quickly, move across the islands quickly without establishing a brick and mortar space. Um, perhaps for the gentleman from Fiji, um, this is something that can be considered when you think about cost and cost of implementing when you may not necessarily have all of the infrastructure in place. So pretty much it was just a matter of them getting to the, to the places, um, you know, making the population in those areas aware that they were going to be there. And they actually did a lot of the educational campaigns for the, for the CBDC. So central banks um, shared that initiative in terms of educating the population on what CBDC is, how to, be, how to enroll, how to be a part of it. So that was one of our key strategies in getting it out to the consumers. Um, another part of the question I think the lady had asked. Um, I forgot her question. Um, it was the uh, impact of CBDC on the private payment player, right? So. The impact of CBDC, and I think your question was along the lines of whether we, we eliminate the intent is to lim eliminate fiat or move in that direction. That's not the intent. Um, in our environment, we, we're of the opinion that fiat will always exist. However, we do expect that there will be a bit of a toggle in terms of the ratios. And that expect expectation is intended to drive the lowering of cost, the lowering of cost for the central bank in terms of production. Um, obviously, if we reduce, we reduce production of paper money, um, there's a lot of cost savings there in terms of storage, mobilization, et cetera. Um, as well for our partners, because um, our partners, the banks, it also helps to reduce costs for them so they see the benefit of incorporating a CBDC into their product offering is that their transport cost is also reduced, their insurance cost is also reduced, the need for maintenance of ABMs, et cetera. So, and even, in, even staffing, right? If you have a CBDC element, then your ratios are also um, adjusted as well. So we don't see the elimination of any other product, um, including Visa. <laughs> um, we just see it as a complement and also being able to, to give those in the financial services market another option. I'm going to turn to Deputy Governor from Senegal. I'm sorry I should have invited you on stage, but could you share, you know, answer some of the questions around, you know, how do you drive adoptions? And then I'm going to go back to Mario about uh, 
what the Central Bank of Morocco asked about, you know, what is the impact on the payment player? I know I insist on this uh, point many times, but I didn't get the answer from you directly. Deputy Governor, please. Yeah, I'm from Nigeria, but I have many Senegalese friends. Um, so the question was, how did we drive? And the word was did, and I want to say we are still driving adoption. I don't think this is something that you just roll out and you drive. I think three things. Um, of course, raising awareness, starting early to deal with, use all the ecosystem. So you have banks. In Nigeria, we have a very um, comprehensive financial system. So you have banks, you have mobile money companies, you have agents, and trying to bring everyone together in the beginning. Use cases. So you need um, the supply side, which is all of these institutions, to help you use their platforms to drive awareness. Because indeed, central banks are not commercial banks, and we are not service providers. And it's important that we realize that from the beginning. But I think you can use um, pull, pull factors where you have good use cases will attract those that need those services to, um, to, to the CBDC. And also using merchants, because if you integrate yourself to stakeholders' lives, so you need to pay for bills, you need to do all of those things. If you make it quite convenient, everyone would want to do it. And the last question was, I don't remember either. <laughs> but that's, what was the last question? Yeah, that was around. Uh, monetary policy transmission, okay, I could answer that. I think we did a quick study. Um, the monetary policy department at Central Bank did a study on what the impact would be. And the gentleman is right. In the short term, it does increase money in circulation because it's um, digital. But it tapers off in like maybe the fourth, fifth, or sixth month, and things go back to normal. The truth is that it has positive effects, but depending on how prevalent your rollout is, because we've kept it really sort of, um, we're taking baby steps, we're not minting so much so that we, we reduce the impact, because it's not just on monetary policy transmission, it's also on disintermediation, you know, getting the banks to come in and, you know, get involved. The truth is that it shrinks, the, the effect is to shrink their balance sheet, you know, and they lose income. Sorry, the last thing on adoption I forgot is incentives, because you have to use, you can use, um, you can use different participants and incentivize them to actually onboard for you, but it has some cost considerations. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, to Mario. So I'm going to try to answer you know, the questions in a holistic way. I think it's very obvious that there is a bit of anxiety about the future of CBDC and the applicable use cases. And as Dr. Alfred said yesterday, he mentioned that CBDC has proven not to be the silver bullet for financial inclusion as a solution. But what, what is true is that CBDC has its own challenges when we talk about interoperability, acceptance, when we talk about offline capabilities. Uh, these are things that we need to come together and discuss to see how can we leverage an existing, for example, an existing payment uh, networks such as Visa, which reaches more than 70 million merchants, on how can we leverage this to allow CBDC to move freely uh, in, in the economy and become uh, an effective mean of payment and doing commerce. On the other hand, I think also central banks need to look into how to enable you know, their RTGS to integrate with the DLT systems so that it becomes seamless, frictionless, so that we create a, a kind of a solution that is trustworthy, that is convenient, and that is familiar for people. And to go back to, to what was mentioned about adoption, I think the only way for, for adoption to increase is that if we come together as public and private sectors and leverage each other's uh, kind of strength to make sure that we're doing whatever is right for the population that we are serving. So if, uh, as a closing note, I believe that enabling you know, the discussion, the dialogue, and collaboration between central banks, Visa, and the likes of Visa would definitely help in at least 
you know, painting a clearer future for CBDC uh, in the economy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Gassan, uh, is there anything you want to add? I think uh, the bigger question, uh, one million question about, uh, do you need CBDC? Everyone in the central bank, uh, do you need the CBDC? Do you need the retail or wholesale? I think this is the question, it's a big question, but must be really in the human capability, how to deal with the CBDC, in the IT infrastructure, in the cyber security. So must be ready as any central bank to deal with the need in the short or mid or long term, must be ready to deal with the CBDC. This is my opinion. Thank you, that's very important. I'm going to answer the question from the gentleman from CGAF, and then I'm going to wrap it because of time. You asked about uh, consumer protection, which is exactly the topic of this discussion today, and somehow we just evaded. Um, when it comes to consumer protection, there are four things that I can think about. One is the safety of the money. When people transact, is the money safe? Two, is the technology safe? Is the message that I send safe and there's not no one coming in the middle and you know hack into the system? Three, is there a consumer protection, uh, consumer complaint mechanism in place to help people who mistakenly send money to somebody else who lost their phone, who forget their password or whatever? And then recently, uh, there's more and more concern about privacy. So when we talk about CBDC, mind you, the question is who holds your information? Do you want the central bank to have all your information? Um, that is very important, and, and, and I don't know the answer. I don't, I don't know what Nigeria or the Bahamas is doing, but that is a big question. And in actually, in developed countries, um, the resistance is really around privacy. Because remember, when I talk about CBDC and cryptocurrencies, it's exactly because people didn't trust the public institution. And here we are, the central bank come and say, come, give me your information, all your transactions, money you send to your girlfriend, your wife, whoever, I've got everything. <laughs> so that's, again, it, it's something that we need to be self. But when it comes to uh, a, a technology and, uh, and the safety of money and uh, customer complaint, I think that is something that's as regulator, even without the CBDC, we need to make sure that it exists. Um, even with Visa, um, I mean, as far as Cambodia is concerned, we have regular meeting with Visa and they will explain to us, you know, what are the fraud that they experienced, how they resolved it, and we want to make sure that, that these are in place. Um, so I'm going to stop here. It's, there's a lot of questions in the room, and I don't think we can answer this today. Um, it, the conversation has been very rich. Thank you to our panelists for your candid answers and sharing, and please give them a big round of applause. Also, uh, today I am asked to announce the launch of a publication that made by AFI, uh, and it is called The Central Bank Digital Currency, an Opportunity for Financial Inclusion in Developing and Emerging Economies, with the question marks. So I can't possibly re summarize everything when the report from AFI itself is still a question mark. So, ladies and gentlemen, the report is available to download. Please uh, go to AFI's website. Um, I don't know whether there's print out outside. Uh, no, so it's just on a, on a digital form. After all, we're talking about digital economy. Uh, it's available. Thank you very much for your attention. Lunch is served. Let's go to lunch. Thank you very much. Please, a big round of applause to all the, uh, our moderator and the excellent guests. Please, a big round of applause. Thank you all so much. Lunch is served now, and the next plenary sessions and breakouts will start at 2 p.m. Thank you so much. Please remember to go on the Cvent GPF hub and do the evaluation for this session. Please add this uh, session to your evaluation tab and complete it. We appreciate the time. Thank you so much.
This uh, session will showcase thought leadership from within the AFI network and beyond on the future of financial regulation and central banking, and how AFI members are already preparing and acting on these risks and opportunities today. Before I invite the panel members to um, come and take their seats, can I ask again, ladies and gentlemen, for your attention? Please, as we start with panel session number five, those of you who have just walked in, we ask that you please take your seats and check that your mobile devices have been activated to silent or vibrate mode. Silent or vibrate mode. Again, thank you so much. Our panel members, ladies and gentlemen, for this session, Martin Galston, the um, Galston, the governor of the Central Bank of Armenia. Can we please um, give a round of applause for Martin? <laughs> Maria Fernanda Caron, board member, Banco Central del Paraguay. Aisha Ahmed, the deputy governor, Central Bank of Nigeria. Sabine Lottenschlager, the former board member of the European Central Bank. And Raza Bagheer, former governor, State Bank of Pakistan. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I hand over this uh, panel discussion to the moderator for this session, the Executive Director, Alliance for Financial Inclusion, Dr. Alfred Hennig. Thank you, Michelle, and good afternoon. Um, as we are a little bit late, uh, I have no time to proceed with my plan to have a little energizer, so I hope you will be energized uh, by this uh, session and um, the powerful composition of this panel. Well, let me maybe start off by, by really saying um, how exciting uh, I find uh, this panel um, actually is and the way it is um, composed. When we look at the history of uh, what we are doing in AFI, but going even further back to the history of, of central banking. I mean, when I studied, uh, there was a lot of uh, literature around central banks having a role in development, development finance. Remember, 70s, early 80s, um, in India, we had many examples. Well, academics were actually very clear, and uh, Washington-based organizations as well, and said, that will all lead to financial repression. And actually, the good intentions of the central banks who intervene directly in markets will actually not lead to the objectives that actually have been um, put out there. And I think we saw similar develop, uh, de uh, developments in, in other continents, including Latin America and so forth. After that, we saw a wave of liberalization, also interest rate liberalization. You remember 1976, famous article, Diaz Alejandro, yeah, uh, goodbye financial repression, hello financial crash. I mean, the argument was very clear. We ended up with a central bank mandate that obviously seemed to be very narrow. Yeah? Price stability was at the forefront. And um, I think that was uh, the school the ruling school for a long time um, until we, I think, reached 97, 98, later 2007, 2008 financial crisis. And again, the mandate obviously started to change. Um, Macroprudential supervision came into the picture, and again, financial stability was added to price stability. So we saw a change of mandate. 2708, we had this already. Further on, 2009, Alliance for Financial Inclusion is founded, takes off. And here we go, we see, like so many countries around the world, who actually have made financial inclusion as part of their mandate. And let me just remind you, and I'm not saying this because that's our headquarter, but Bank Negara, Malaysia, put financial inclusion into their mandate already way back in 2009. Yeah. 
that's a very interesting um, milestone to keep in mind. So when you go further, further down the road, you see that um, many more countries, even start at central banks, started to take the lead in formulating national financial inclusion strategies. Yeah? And now I think we have 63 nas um, national strategies in the network, and another 16 are currently being reviewed or reformulated to include, for example, gender inclusive finance aspects and others. So this is a very uh, impressive uh, development, and I think we should take note of it. Now, when you go even further, you see that uh, technology has really taken the space. And uh, risks of technology keep regulators very busy. Why? Because now you have new entrants of market players. And that led to what we in the network conceived to what we call a convergence around challenges, but also solutions to mitigate risks of technology. So we felt that it's no longer the case that you will find um, solutions just in one place of the world. You will not find solutions just in the global north or in the global south or east or west. What we now see is that there are pockets where you can get the experience. And we need to bring this knowledge to the surface. That led us actually to a, to a, um, a conference we held with the Czech National Bank uh, 2019 around um, inclusive fintech and convergence around this issue where we had developing country central banks as well as um, advanced economy central banks and there was a common denominator around these issues so that was very interesting but then we moved on and I was very impressed I, in 2020 G24 AFI meeting in Washington DC virtual uh, back to back with uh, the spring meeting, I had uh, Reza Bakia on the panel who is sitting here, and he spoke about youth financial inclusion in um, Pakistan. And I said, hey, wait a minute, uh, you're, the, you're a central banker. Uh, but I, it was very impressive. A and I kind of groomed the idea we have to have a discussion around this. So, and then last year at uh, G24 AFI, there was another um, interesting panel where we had Governor Nyoroge, Central Bank of Kenya. We also had uh, Jennifer Sullivan from Central Bank of Seychelles, but also um, uh, we had one more, one more Central Bank there on that panel. But again, here it was around inclusive clean. It was Paraguay, actually. It was Central Bank of Paraguay, uh, Senor Senora, the president of Central Bank of Paraguay, where we spoke about inclusive green finance. And here again, I got the impression things have changed. Now, having said that, my question here with this, why we called it contemporary financial regulation, is you read a lot about uh, central banking of the future. And there's even a very interesting research project completed by the, by the Ford Institute at the University of Michigan. It's a whole research project. You have a report, Central Bank of the Future, funded by the Gates Foundation. Very interesting exercise. We actually met Aisha virtually on that very, uh, um, I mean, very panel, um, where they again concluded um, that in the future we see a further evolution of the mandate. But with my personal experience, I wasn't sure whether it is central banking of the future. So I was actually thinking, is it, is it not already happening? In, let's say, some kind of back to the future? Or is it contemporary? Is it now? Or is it future? This is the question that this panel, I think, will deal with. And um, I'm a bit nervous, yeah, because I'm here with um, very seasoned senior professionals. I would call them, they're all thoroughbred central bankers. Yeah? And um, they have shown in their respective jurisdiction um, how they have managed their agendas, and they have been globally engaged. So uh, we are very privileged to have this diversity on the panel, but it's also a regional diversity. Um, we could cover almost all the regions. Unfortunately, we couldn't cover all of them, but this is a variety, and I think we will get very interesting insights from the various regions. But there's another element here, and this is interesting. We have 
former and current central bankers on the panel, which sometimes can be helpful, especially when the former ones feel that maybe it's now time to share things that they would have shared more between the lines um, when they were still in their roles. But anyway, I don't want to provoke this discussion uh, too much. What I want to say is there is no need here around this topic to reach consensus. Yeah? There can be controversy, but whatever we take away from this, we will take it to the next level of discussion. So the ambition, uh, sorry, the ambition seems to be a bit more low-key, but with this panel, I don't want to put my neck too wide, too far out of the window because I don't want to lose control of this panel, and I think that can easily happen uh, when you have uh, such a powerful panel with you. Now, let me, in order to save time, just introduce the panel to you um, very quickly. Next to me, I have um, Aisha Ahmad, who is the deputy governor at the Central Bank of Nigeria. Aisha, as I learned, is not only a central banker, but also has experience as a private banker. So uh, she has seen several sides of the coin. <laughs> Next to her, Martin Galstian, the governor of the Central Bank of Armenia, um, is an academic who has done a lot of academic work, but a very, very seasoned central banker, now managing the Central Bank of Armenia. Our next central banker, Maria Fernanda Caron, board member of the Central Bank of Paraguay. She was the president of a development bank in Paraguay, also managed a private bank, but is now actually guiding the central bank in the Paraguay. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Reza Bakir, until recently the governor of the State Bank of Pakistan, now uh, doing many interesting things, but before working 19 years with the IMF. Thank you, Reza, for coming. <laughs> and lastly, Sabine Lautenschläger, former board member of the European Central Bank, before vice president of the Deutsche Bundesbank, and also vice president of the German Financial Supervisory Authority, the BaFin, um, a bank supervisor and central banker by nature, I would say. So thank you very much for coming, Sabrina. So I hope you are a little bit excited. I am very excited, I must say. This is a, this is a great opportunity. Let's get started, Reza. Now, look, uh, my first question to you is um, just you know, following up on, on what we have said. To what extent do you think should central banks and financial regulators consider inequality, inequality and other socio-economic challenges in their policy making? And could you give some practical examples? Sure. Thank you, Alfred, for the invitation, first of all, to be here with all of you. And let me congratulate you and your colleagues at AFI for putting together such a wonderful event. Great to be here in Jordan, and also congratulate you for putting together this very interesting panel on contemporary financial regulation and central banking. In my uh, opening remarks, first of all, Alfred, I want to just take a step a little bit back and cover this overall issue of um, central bank mandates, and in particular, talk about whether central banks should be proactive about pushing progress in some of the areas that we will be talking about in this panel, such as inequality, such as gender, such as climate. I think it's important to first just hear perspectives on that. Should central banks be pushing this agenda in a proactive manner? It's a very important question. I think it's very important to have a rich debate around it, and the debate should not be taken very lightly for two reasons. One, central banks are very powerful institutions. I learned that more in my job than I did at the IMF. And second, there is an opportunity cost 
if you get a central bank to work more on these areas, the central bank will, given its finite resources, be working less in some other areas. So I think you're, it's very important to take this debate very, very importantly. Now, for me, Alfred, and I'll mention this to my panelists, fellow panelists as well, you know, my views on this very important question have been shaped by my personal journey, and I'm sure probably for everybody, but in preparing for this, I was myself taking stock of how my personal journey has shaped my life. Now, I was born in Lahore, Pakistan, second largest city in the world's fifth largest country. Grew up there until I went to the U.S. to study. And then ended up working at the World Bank for two years, at the IMF for 19 years, until May of 2019 when I resigned from the IMF to come back and do public service. And I spent three years as the governor of our central bank and completed my term in May. Now, when I joined the IMF in the year 2000, you were trained, you know, as part of the Economist program, which is their intake program for young professionals. You are trained in how the IMF thinks and how you are supposed to go and advise countries around the world. So I was steeped thoroughly in what was then the IMF and the central bank orthodoxy. Okay? I'm talking 2000s. 2000, the year 2000 is when I joined the IMF. And I think it's important to recap that. Because I can, get it, I can tell you that in everything that I was trained about, there was, I do not think, any mention of climate, no mention of gender, no mention of inequality, in fact, probably no mention of all of the things that you have on the panel today. And there were some big do's and some big don'ts that were taught to us fresh graduates out of a PhD program in our early formative stage. The biggest do was that central banks should focus primarily, if not only, on price stability. The biggest don't was central banks should never, ever lend to governments. It was, in fact, since we are in a biblical setting, it was bigger than the original sin. It was bigger than the bite of the apple that expelled Adam and Eve from heaven. That was the don't, was the biggest don't that we were taught as young recent employees at the IMF. Now, I saw that evolve, and my first evolution was in the IMF, when I saw that thinking evolve. And to me, a clear point when that evolved was the Lehman Brothers collapse instigated global financial crisis. It was the first global crisis in my professional career which was caused by advanced economies as opposed to developing countries. The previous ones that I remembered were the Asian financial crisis, the Mexican tequila crisis, the Russian crisis, but this was the first caused by advanced economies. And I saw that the conventional view changing and that cardinal sin of not lending to the governments being committed Suddenly, quantitative easing, which is, in other words, buying immeasurable amounts of government securities in the market to either directly or indirectly provide credit to the government to control interest rates was suddenly a done thing. So that view had already evolved, and I could not help but notice that that had occurred. The second key evolution in my thinking about central bank mandates occurred when I resigned from the IMF and went back to Pakistan to serve as governor. And then I, for the first time in my professional life, realized how different it was to be at the IMF, going around telling 
other central bank governors and ministers of finance what to do. And suddenly, realizing what the reality is <laughs> on the other end. I had never been a central bank governor. I had never been trained at the IMF to be a central bank governor. I had only been trained to be effective in telling central bank governors what to do <laughs> and using a combination of carrots and sticks to get the job done, but not to actually be on the other end and see all the challenges that exist inside an institution. And that, to me, was the second key evolution. And I realized, I realized back then that in countries like Pakistan, there are market failures galore. And I realized then that if you are in a country where the central bank itself is a good professional institution, and it's considered to be one, the tools that are available to a central bank are far too important and powerful to not be used for addressing some glaring problems that you see in the country. And I want to be a bit concrete about it. In Pakistan, inclusion is a huge agenda that is left unaddressed. Women, farmers, SMEs, they are all hugely excluded from the financial system. There is a financial inclusion strategy. But the question to me was, is the central bank fully using the tools that are available to it to push this agenda? But now, this issue became very tricky. Because I also had the IMF to deal with, because Pakistan was under an IMF program. And in Pakistan, the IMF was primarily giving the same orthodoxy that it would in other countries. And I was suddenly realizing that it is far, it'll, be, it'll be far too big a missed opportunity if we don't fight for some of these. My views, therefore, evolved on that. And I want to just mention one thing, which is that in Pakistan, one of the conditions under the IMF program was to revise the central bank law to give it more independence. And while we did, in terms of the objectives, provide clarity that our primary objective is price stability, check, on the economic ortho orthodoxy agenda, our secondary objective is financial stability. It sort of has crept into the mandates of central banks. Our tertiary objective, the third objective, is to support development and growth. You can phrase it whichever way you want. But right after the para on the objectives of the central bank, we put in a section on the functions of the central bank. And in that, we put in specific language for, to promote financial inclusion in Pakistan. Now, obviously, the functions cannot contradict the objectives. But I thought it's very important right at the very beginning to tell everybody that my personal journey has shaped my views that in countries like Pakistan, the agenda on uh, issues such as socioeconomic equality is far too important for central banks to not cover while having adequate protections, and we can talk about that, so that that power is not abused. And when we get into some further discussion, I'm happy to give some examples of specific policies that we did. But when we had the opportunity, when our law was being revised, we put this in the law so that when we are now actively pursuing this agenda, we are actually following the law of the country. Thank you. Thank you very much, Reza. Thank you. Well. Um, Thank you for sharing this uh, personal, professional story. And I could actually sense from the crowd that uh, it resonates in this room. Now, um, let me uh, turn to Sabine. But Sabine, before I do that, I just wanted to alert um, the crowd here that um, Maria Fernanda is going to speak in Spanish later on. No? He will speak in Spanish so that you just... That, 
that you just have your your thing is ready. No, anyway, um, Sabine, when you listen to Reza, I mean, I have a question for you, but I maybe have two. The first one is, what do you think? Do you want to react to this? And the second question is actually uh, on the debate that there is uh, on the extent to which central banks should be addressing issues such as climate change and the loss of biodiversity. In other words, should the regulator be proactive in incentivizing the transition to a greener and more sustainable financial system or not? And if so, to which extent? That would be the question. But first question is, I'm just interested. Your reaction, Teresa? Well, first I have to join and agree with Reza in my, me thanking you for the invitation to this great event yeah, and in your praise yeah, of the organization here. So it's really lovely uh, to be here and to be able to exchange views. Yeah. Second, I do not agree with him. Yeah? And I know that you asked me as a second one in order to have a certain kind of friction here in this uh, panel and I'm, I'm willingly delivering. You know? Um, I, I fully agree um, that um, the objectives of having financial inclusion of um, fighting against the climate change are of utmost importance. Yeah? So do not misunderstand me. And I take into account that in different countries we are at different development stages uh, with regard to the institutional setup uh, with regard to the organizations, the governments, etc. Yeah? So there are different needs. Yeah? Nevertheless, I fear that, um, as I agree with Reza, that central banks are very powerful institutions and that governments tend to give nasty tasks to central banks because they believe you know, that they are cost-free. Yeah? I worry for the long-term costs for a central bank when increasing um, um, its mandate. Yeah? So for me, the first message would be, when fighting inequality, yeah, um, the first and the best way for a central bank to fight inequality is to maintain price stability, because inflation hits the poorest the most. Let's be very clear. Yeah, it's not the rich people which are hit and violated by inflation, but the poorest. Yeah. So to have um, price stability, um, to have, and here I take the financial stability as an under, yeah, uh, a subtopic, yeah, to have financial stability will attract investors yeah, in order to ensure um, that financing of companies are done uh, by a financial stable uh, system as well as um, by investors from the outside or the inside. Yeah? So um, making it easier, easier for a company to attract these investors is something what the central bank can do within its mandate of maintaining price stability. Second, my worry is with regard to the long-term cost, and you, you will not be surprised, Reza, that I'm not so much of a fan of quantitative easing. Yeah? Um, um, I, I think, and this is the beauty of being a former central banker, I can be quite open. Yeah? Um, I think when you do quantitative, I mean, there are, there are points in time where it is justified as an ultima ratio, you know, in a very restricted way. But how it was done by many, many countries was to more or less build a bridge on the one side of the river in order and in the hope, with the intention of a government yeah, to build the other side of the bridge, you know? Um, and most governments didn't, you know? So you are going more or less in a kind of pre-arranged agreement where the other side doesn't, yeah, conclude this agreement, yeah? Because as a central bank, as an economist, yeah, we usually agree that if you do quantitative easing, you do this in order to smoothen the way to a more competitive macroeconomic environment that the 
um, national economy yeah, is preparing yeah, for being more competitive, that it is doing structural reforms in a way that in the long term yeah, um, the economy is faring better without doing quantitative easing, because this is an, uh, a tool which you cannot use forever. Yeah? So what did most governments do? I'm, I'm missing a lot of structural reforms, I'll tell you, in Germany, for example, the country I'm coming from. I didn't see sufficient structural reforms in many other European countries in order to prepare for the future. Yeah? So it is not cost-free to use these kind of tools. When you gain additional mandates, and I fully understand, I mean, I'm a woman, yeah? I mean, I fight for gender equality like a lioness, you say in English, yeah? Yeah? Um, I, I think that as soon as you increase your mandate, politics will look at, at you in a much more thorough way. They will ask themselves, oh, we get an institution which gets over the years powerful and more powerful, and they more or less manage and steer the economy and sometimes political topics in a way like a government does, but they are not democratic legitimate. So we should curb their independence. Yeah? So it is not cost-free to use these tools the, of a powerful institution, but my worry is that on the long term, yeah, politicians will increase their influence um, in the central bank, and that the long-term perspective of a central banker on the economy yeah, will be disturbed and distorted by short-term political um, objectives. And that is why I advise and recommend to, um, to think very carefully about what you wish to get, you know, in order to see the cost you later have to pay. That does not mean that you cannot support gender equality or equality or that a central bank should not know what kind of consequences its uh, application of tools has on the poorest and what kind of uh, distribution changes you have of assets and wealth. Yeah? That is not what I'm saying. Yeah? You should be very aware of all of the consequences. You should use all of your intellectual capacity as well as your disclosure the capacity to support, for example, the fight against climate change by what we could do, asking everybody, every bank who wants to put collateral into your collateral pool to disclose, for example, the climate consequences of this collateral pool. So to be transparent and to increase and support transparency and disclosure in everything what climate-related issues are discussed, or to, for example, disclose that financing for women is less risky than financing of men. Yeah? Um, the women, many studies say so, are the better borrowers, customers of banks because they tend to be uh, paying back their loans in, in a much better way than men. So if we disclose and collect data of these kind of risks, we can support gender equality and the financing of women uh, by ensuring that the risk taken over via female loans yeah, is lower and hence been recognized, for example, in the capital treatment um, um, of banks. So we can do quite a lot by using our intellectual capacities, by collecting data, by disclosing, um, by ensuring that our own investment portfolio in central banks are green, you know, that yes. But be careful, be cautious what you wish to get with regard to the conse consequences to your independence. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, um, I heard at least three worries, but well founded, and I think we will continue because Martin Galstian from Salonga Arminia, Harvard trained economist, 
so to speak, geographically, not too far away from Washington, D.C., right? Now, question is, really picking on what Sabine said, how can regulators actually manage an appropriate balance between moving into new areas and priorities without detriment to the core mission of price stability and financial stability? Is it possible or is it, is it such a challenge that it is not possible? No. Um, first of all, let me thank uh, our friends from Central Bank of Jordan and Duffy for, for this wonderful event. Um, and this panel, I was like thinking whether I just need to shut up and listen to what colleagues were saying because there is so much wisdom in the words on both sides. But um, if you allow, I'll just share a couple of ideas as well. Um, everything starts with personal experience and personal journey, as Reza said, because when you look at the things from one angle, it's not the same thing and when you look at it and when you start doing things, right? So going back to Pakistan and facing the challenges of Pakistani society at the first hand made Reza think a bit differently than orthodoxy would tell you. So um, I'll try, I'll throw out my notes, but I've made a couple of new notes, which might be probably a bit more relevant. So um, there are <clears throat> several things that we can do, but general idea that I would probably formulate as cooperation um, is based on the premise that the challenges that we're currently facing are so immense, are so huge, that no one institution can solve it alone. Being at the best trained central bank, be it democratically elected government, being the best business or academia in the world. So it's a joint effort from my understanding. And then everyone as an orchestra should play its own and unique role in all the symphony that we want to construct around solving these issues like gender, climate, inequality and all those things. Because monetary policy by itself cannot tackle the entire spectrum of issues and that's why we have fiscal policy and that's why we have structural policies and I think that working with a government with responsible government is the only way forward because otherwise um, even central banks which are not driven by political cycles and probably I might sound controversial from my understanding, we are the true guardians of our people's uh, aspirations, the expectations. Not the political parties, not the politicians. But nevertheless, if we take the role of the only plain town, as Mohammed El Erian once puts it, once puts it, then there are so many risks associated with intervening into our independence. Uh, as Sabine mentioned, uh, many governments would love to control what central banks do. Even in orthodox part of our daily business, you see banks all around the world that are, not many, but some, decreasing the interest rates meanwhile having 80% inflation, which is probably a suicide for long-term development of the country and the economy. But Central banks are pushed to do so. The best central banks that we used to know. Then if you look at the Phillips curve and then your understanding of the Phillips curve is not full employment or Nairo, but a very specific racial minority, and then you need to wait until there is a full employment for that racial minority. Before you start tightening the cycle, then you are behind the curve. And that all comes from political spectrum and political interference into the dealings of the central bank. So um, I'll stand with Sabine on this, that we should be proactive in the field that is our own. So assigning risk weights, taking capital adequacy ratio, doing this and that, that is all in our domain, and we should be absolutely proactive in those things. But things which are structural in nature, 
solving the problem of inequality, solving the problem of green finance and so on. Those are the steps that I should be a bit more cautious and in doing it alone. I would rather partner it with a responsible government, business and academia, than going and doing it alone. Thank you. Well, Alfred, no. it's right now two versus Please one. Please go ahead. Go so, ahead. Uh, you know, I do. Uh, if you, I do. You have one minute. Okay, okay. I have uh, one minute. I do want to, you know, try to make a comeback. And, <laughs> and um, you know, to, to make the point that this uh, trade off between price stability and some of the other causes, I think in most cases, is an artificial trade-off. In many cases, at least, it is one. And my main point is, it, it is not a trade-off that should be used for a central bank to not engage in areas that may be critically important. And I want to give one concrete example. In Pakistan, the State Bank of Pakistan started a program at where it played a critical role for affordable mortgages in what is affordable mortgages? It is mortgages where the government would subsidize the interest rate such that a mortgage becomes affordable. The role of the central bank was to get the banks organized that commercial banks would entertain such requests. It was a program where you could not get this mortgage if the place that you were buying was more than 125 square yards, 125 square yards, just so that people are not confused, is maybe one half of the area of this stage that we are in, in which a typical family of about five people in Pakistan, two parents, two children, and adults such as a mother or a father would be living in one small place. In Pakistan, mortgages in percent of GDP before this program were probably less than 0.01 percent of GDP. In Pakistan, because the poor and the lower middle class and the middle class cannot have home ownership because banks will not lend to them. They will never benefit from the rising tide of rising real estate or housing prices. They will never feel part of the rising journey. And guess what? Since our independence in 1947, that's how things work. Now, if we say that there is a trade-off between price stability and the program that we launched, which, just so that people know, today, from nearly maybe zero, there are $1 billion worth of bank approvals of affordable mortgages for families that are going to live in 125 square yards. No rich person will want to get this mortgage because rich people don't like to live in small houses. That's a fact. Right? So, so my point was that if we just think there is a trade-off and the central bank doesn't push in this area, we miss out on some incredible opportunities that only the central bank, through its leverage on commercial banks, can use to address glaring socioeconomic wealth inequality in countries. It has to be limited. It has to be transparent. It has to be watched over so that it's not abused. But if it is not tried, we miss out on a great opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Well, thank you for reiterating the point. And I, I can imagine that this uh, is itching for some others to respond. But I want to now come uh, to Maria Fernanda, who I think can also uh, share with us on the Latin American perspective on these issues. But um, let's also pick on the word that you have just used, trade-off. Yeah. Uh, so my question really is, um, financial regulation um, has been heavily influenced, as we all know, by the global standards yeah. and financial integrity, on financial integrity and stability. Now, the question that we have here is, are we closer? or further away today to achieving an effective alignment between financial integrity and stability goals on the one hand, 
with a need for innovation and inclusion on the other. Because that's the thing that everyone is struggling with. Well, first of all, I want to thank Kathy. It's a pleasure to be in this panel. And as same as Martin, in a way, I just want to listen <laughs> to Sabine and Nasha, which was, was really interesting. I regard, but I prefer to speak in Spanish. So please put your things. Well, realmente, eh, comparto lo que ha indicado Asha sobre este dilema entre buscar una estabilidad financiera, pero al mismo tiempo ir sobre cuestiones esenciales que necesitan nuestros países. Paraguay es un país de 7 millones de habitantes, un país pobre, al lado de dos potencias. Y el dilema es justamente llegar a esa estabilidad financiera, pero al mismo tiempo atender cuestiones esenciales como la inclusión financiera, como también una finanza sostenible. Hemos pasado en los últimos dos años y medio por la revisión de GAFI. Todos acá sabemos qué implica estar en una lista gris o en una lista negra. Finalmente, en septiembre hemos tenido una evaluación positiva del país, pero eso implicó que tuviéramos que aprobar más de 10 leyes fortificando justamente todo lo que hace al, a las leyes al lavado de dinero y a, a, a la prevención del terrorismo. Eso es importantísimo y creemos que es fundamental. Eso también impuso que el Banco Central revise sus regulaciones y haga cada vez más estrictas sus regulaciones. Y ahí tenemos un dilema. ¿Cómo llegamos a, ante esas regulaciones mucho más estrictas, seguir incluyendo financieramente a nuestra población. Paraguay tiene el 50% de su población joven excluida. De 18 a 35 años es el porcentaje más alto de exclusión. Y yo creo que ahí, y ayer escuchaba eh, unas cuestiones interesantes como salir de la caja y pensar de forma disruptiva. Creo que hay cuestiones esenciales que nosotros sí como Banco Central tenemos que ser disruptivos al encontrar soluciones. Como, el Banco, como Banco Central del Paraguay, ante esto buscamos un, un, un régimen simplificado de Know Your Customer, de manera de que todo el abordaje del riesgo más bajo tenga otro, otro sistema y otra forma, y de esa manera, aún con estas regulaciones necesarias, podamos seguir incluyendo financieramente a la gente. Y también hemos desarrollado o hemos incluido dentro de la supervisión del Banco Central del Paraguay a las billeteras electrónicas, a las telefonías que hacen pagos electrónicos. Hemos permitido que ellas estén dentro de nuestro paraguas, dentro de nuestra supervisión. Y eso ha permitido que casi un millón de paraguayos tengan al menos una cuenta básica. Eso ha permitido que sin la inclusión en Paraguay en el año 2011 era de 22%, haya pasado al 54% en el 2021. Porque en una población pobre, en una población rural, necesitamos medios tecnológicos y disruptivos para que nuestra gente pueda acceder a algún servicio financiero. Entonces creo que buscar tecnología, Buscar plataformas disruptivas son más que necesarias para estos países. Eh, no obstante, creemos que se puede hacer más, pero pensamos que hoy eh, el pasar la evaluación de Gafi no era un objetivo del Banco Central, era un objetivo del país, y al mismo tiempo es también un objetivo del país incluir financieramente a más personas. Con lo cual creo que existen herramientas y podemos buscar la manera de ejercer ese rol. Coincido de que nuestro, por mandato, nuestro primer mandato es la estabilidad monetaria, pero no obstante debemos tener roles 
en nuestros países y con las necesidades de nuestros países, roles también activos en la inclusión y sobre todo en la inclusión de género. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. I, well, I don't want to conclude at this point, but um, I do see uh, some, some pattern coming, coming out of this discussion. I think we will we'll come back to this later. Thank you so much. Uh, DG Aisha, uh, now just uh, following up on this, on the Nigerian uh, case, but you might even want to speak broader um, <clears throat> from the perspective of the African continent. Um, again, on the trade-off, how should the policymakers and regulators best manage the trade-offs between, between integrity and stability and financial inclusion and innovation? What's, what's, what's your recommendation? And please feel free also to react to what you heard earlier. Okay. I think when you listen to Sabine, she makes very, very important points. And it makes sense from that theoretical perspective. The truth of the matter is that in many developing economies, there are real problems that are now, because a lot of the structural challenges and a lot of the suggestions that the IMF and other similar organizations prefer require you to wait many, many, many years to get the environment right. For example, financial inclusion is much higher in developing developed economies. The monetary policy transmission is much quicker. The, um, the federal, um, the rate, so the monetary policy rate, for example, is more potent. You make a change in monetary policy and in, in, instantly the transmission works through the banks and you achieve your objectives. In developing economies like Nigeria, you still have a high unemployment rate. You still have banks that are unwilling to lend to certain parts of the real sector that really affect um, employment. So you're talking agriculture, you're talking manufacturing, you're talking healthcare. In fact, during COVID, we saw how some countries' protectionism in terms of medicine and food brought to the fore that you need to actually enable and develop your people to be able to be resilient in that respect. So when you have all of that in front of you, including exclusion, financial exclusion, it's difficult to make the argument that the central bank should sit on its hands and do nothing. Having said that, there are many real repercussions around the exposure to the political class. And I think we should think more around building in safeguards whilst we actually do what we need to do to save people's lives today. So she talks about it not being costly. Yes, there's a cost to pay would rather it's not paid with lives today. And that's my view on that. <laughs> on the balance, I don't think that um, financial integrity and stability versus inclusion are mutually exclusive. I even think they could be mutually reinforcing. And a good example is, so we talk about financial um, ID, for example, requiring ID as a means of exclusion. What we did with the bank verification number, which is a biometric-based um, platform, actually helped include people and also helped us with stability. That's a good example. You can take a risk-based approach. The three-tiered KYC is the best example of a risk-based approach to say, okay, um, there's low connectivity. You might not be able to get biometric, but if you want to do microtransactions, you want to do transactions under a certain amount, I'll just ask for your photograph and you can transact. So I don't think that we have two spectrums that we need to work with. I think it's all very nuanced. When you were talking in your opening statement, something you said struck me about how central banks are focusing on increasingly different things. One thing I noticed is that from the moves from price stability to financial stability to financial inclusion to looking at climate to looking at gender, if you notice, Central banks don't need to change their formal mandate. What does that tell you? Legally, their legal frameworks have stayed the same, and it's allowed them to go into these areas. And I think for me, it says that these subjects are not as far away from price stability as you would imagine. 
when in Nigeria the central bank enables farmers with access to low-cost finance to ensure that one we expand yields and when we come in to intervene around protecting um, farm gate losses we are actually working on the price stability mandate because in the um, um, in the calculation you know of inflation food is a huge company and if you can deal with the food element then you solve that so it's not a it's not an either or it's about looking for opportunities to make people's lives better while building the institutions and the collaboration and i agree with that one collaborating with the fiscal authorities getting the private sector in to make those long-term structural changes that you need but i think the problems that stay out in the face need to be handled immediately Well, is there anyone in the room who would like to say something? Only one. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> is there a hand? We have a microphone, right? Any question? Any here? There's a gentleman. Please be short, and I'm sure you will get a good answer. answer to that? I think that's your question. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, many thanks for, for this comment, I think it was. There was not so much a question. Huh? But, um, um, but I'm, we are, I can put a question mark behind it. Don't, don't uh, yeah? Don't worry. Don't worry. Um, and it gives me the, the possibility to answer a little bit to that. <laughs> Too, yeah. So many thanks for making Please this do comment. It. Yeah. Um, let, let, let me be clear again. I think that the, fighting the climate change and the need for having a systemically changing, you know, certain things is obvious. Yeah. And I'm not against this, but I'm questioning whether the central bank should put um, all the shoes which are in front of us, meaning all the problems which are in front of us in their own portfolio, you know, and rather should perhaps leave it to other people who are in charge too, you know. You can, I mean, you can find 10 very, very important topics where the central bank with all its money and all its power can do something. Where do we want to stop? Because then we should propose to take over just the government and have no politicians anymore. <laughs> but let's, let's be, I mean, I met, I, met, I met European, I will not say whom, but I met European representatives, banking supervisors in the BCBS who privately talked to each other and said, you know, sometimes it's better to have no government and to be governed by technocrats yeah, than by te uh, politicians. It, that is now very provocative. I'm an absolutely believer in democracy. Ne? Do not misunderstand me. Yeah? Um, no, no. I mean, I, I fear for our democracy, and I think it is very needed. So it was really just a joke. But, but I, I think when having, when having price stability, yeah, 
you have the economic um, underlying criteria in order to fight against climate change. You know, if you have inf inflation like you see nowadays in Germany, half of the population doesn't think about climate change anymore because they think about how can I pay the food. Yeah. Um, so I think price stability yeah, gives you a stability for the government to work on other problems. Yeah. And I will not belittle the problems, I mean, we all have, and you in particular have, in, in, in financial inclusion, in you know, the, the question of mortgages, etc. But I'm, I'm, I ask myself, and I'm an outsider, so I want to be modest. Yeah? I mean, I'm not saying that I'm correct, because I'm not living in these countries and do not know the political and the structural environment. So I will be really modest. Yeah? But the first question came when, when I heard you both, Aisha and Reza, talking. I asked myself, are you crowding out other players? You know, because in the first step, it is cheaper to go to the central bank. Yeah? You do not have to put the state budget in your hand. Thank you so much. <laughs> Fantastic. Alfred, you wanted to have a conversation now. Well, yeah, but, <laughs> but that's, that's exactly it. And I think that was everyone appreciate. Now let's talk about the pair of shoes. How many pairs of shoes? I mean, not, I'm not asking how many pairs of shoes. I'm asking in front of you. In front of, no, seriously, she, she said many pairs of shoes you want to take or only one pair or maybe two pairs. What is the answer? Okay. It's not a simple one. Depends on what I'm wearing. <laughs> um, <laughs> Um, so, quick one on crowding out. I think the model we use is we work with them, we don't crowd them out. Um, so, a middle ground, I agree with you on climate change in terms of, strictly speaking, can we do this? I think Lagarde, what did she say? She said that the fact that central banks are not in the driving seat on climate change does not mean we don't have a role to play. I think the role we play is the convening power we have to bring attention to this issue to call everybody up and say, this is important. That's one side. I think the second side is climate-related financial risk should not be taken as a joke because it has an impact. We've already seen the impact of climate change in the Sahel region in Africa. We've seen floods where they shouldn't be. We've seen droughts where they shouldn't be. But more importantly, the conversation about climate change is very different in developing economies and developed economies. In Nigeria, we're still talking about energy security. We're talking about a just transition for many of the economies that are in this you know, membership. You can't do it without the central bank enabling the private sector to come in. So I guess that's the middle ground. No driver's seat. But here I agree. I mean, okay. there are fully. I agree with you on that one. Good. <laughs> Very good. Great, but I can see that uh, Reza has a point to make. But, but Reza. Uh, try, try uh, three, uh, three very, very quick points. You know, the, <laughs> you know, the first is that, just to be clear, I would not favor anything that a central bank does that would compromise price stability, okay? My point is that that still leaves open a very large space where a central bank given the tools that it has, and given the fact that if you want to do anything economic in a country, you have to work through banks, the very large space where some sensible things, they have a low bar, so some very basic sensible things can be done. I'll give you an example. The State Bank of Pakistan launched out this strategy called Banking on Equality, a strategy to promote women's financial inclusion. We required every single commercial bank that its board has to approve a gender mainstreaming strategy. We required commercial banks that they have to reach diversity targets in their own employment. We required commercial banks that they have to offer not gender neutral, but gender intentional assets and liabilities products. We could also not have done that if we thought that a central bank should only go deeper into areas such as price stability. So my point is that 
do not do anything that compromises price stability. But it leaves open a very large space. Second point, just answering on that question, it's important in my view to, uh, on your question of crowding out, is to say that, you know, if it were the case that we were crowding out players, and I'm seeing more generally, of providers of mortgages in the country, we would have had a lot of mortgages in the country to begin with. The fact that there is a market failure where commercial banks themselves do not want to cater to these customers. I just want to make sure we know what we're talking about. We're talking about an average loan size of $13,000, okay? This is the size of the mortgage, given the size of the place that I just described. The average monthly payment on these loans is $87 per month. These are the types of customers that often commercial banks train their staff that you don't entertain such people in the bank branch because, you know, their clothes are smelly or they are going to affect the ambience of the bank branch. How do you get commercial banks to cater to these people who deserve as much the right to home ownership as the rich do? And the problem was, that if there were people, institutions, that were fully finding it incentive compatible to address these issues and make money out of it, it hadn't happened. And therefore, when there is a void and a market failure and an opportunity to do something without compromising on price stability, my point is, let us actively think what are those opportunities that don't compromise price stability yet allow us to address glaring socio-economic problems that many countries have. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Martin, uh, let's, uh, let's pull this up to, to, to one level higher, this discussion, because it, it, it seems that um, the global challenges that we are all aware of uh, have an impact on, on, on the central banks, and uh, there's pressure, there are new tasks, there are expectations. Um, there's talk on the evolution of the mandate in order to mitigate the impact. So, from your point of view, how important is the preservation of central bank independence? And to what extent is it under threat in the current global economic and political environment? <clears throat> so first, uh, let me echo to the question and what Reza said. I think we all fully agree with the first statement that you did. If there is no, we're not compromising on price stability, there are so many things that we can do even without having a legal mandate for that. What Reza was describing with, with home equity loans and that type of instruments, Central Bank of Armenia does that for decades, for at least a decade. But we're doing it in a very strict environment and MPL is around 0.2%. So we're doing it. What, what I'm saying about the mandate is probably one or two levels up in terms of abstraction. And then comes your question with uh, how important is it to be independent? Uh, I think it is critical. And I'm not telling it because I'm a central banker, but I'm telling you because of conviction. Um, when politics starts intervening in the domain of central banking, uh, I haven't seen any good example of the outcome. I've seen many good examples of s independent central banks doing great things for the countries, but I have never seen an example when politics start meddling in central banking business, and then we have a wonderful outcome out of it. So um, do we see examples currently around the world when governments intervening into actions of the central banks? Um, without mentioning names, yes. And that's sobering. Because I, I'll probably repeat myself, I feel that we are one of those guardians who protect long-term productive uh, economic growth, because we all understand that in the long term money is neutral, 
and the only thing which is important is productivity. That's why, according to our mandate, and when the gentleman asked that question about the price stability, I think we are doing a great service to our society by having price stability in place. Because those two, three decades of price stability, if you look at the graph, would show you that that were the periods where we had the biggest increase in GDP per capita probably around the world. And what governments should have been doing during those good times, probably saving more for the rainy day. Uh, sounds familiar, right? But do they do it? Going with more stricter standards for their domestic production. Can they do that? As I think it was Jean-Paul Juncker once said, we know what the right things to do, but we don't know how to be re-elected afterwards. That's completely the program and the problem that we're facing. So politicizing central banking would do a big damage to the entire society. Well, thank you. Now, uh, Maria Fernanda, uh, from the South American perspective, I actually would like to ask you exactly the same question. How important is the independence, and is it under threat or under pressure because of these pressures that we get that are actually outside or beyond the original or traditional mandate of the central bank? What, what's your view on this? Well, I think that the only way that we can our work is independence. It's no other way. And in, uh, oh, in Paraguay, uh, we have like a our policy monetary budget is independent, but no, our administrative budget, and it's a problem. <laughs> Imagine if we, ha we have to spend money in technology, and maybe the Congress can tell us tomorrow that we have to spend less. So that we have to, and, and we are fighting to have full independence. It's the only way to do well, our work, and I think at the end that our countries, we have to fight for that, and even in countries with political issue, the independence of a central bank, what the things that will make the stability of their economy, so it's more than important. That's it. Thank you. Now, is there one more from the from the from the floor? Another intervention or question? Where? Please. Thank you. Please introduce yourself. <laughs> About the previous question, um, when we talk, for example, uh, the enforcement of the central bank in Paraguay, we have the example of the environmentalism. Just when the central bank issue a regulation, we get that enforcement. Because in that way, we get that the financial institution not only take care about financial risk, they also take about financial environmental risk. So sometimes I think that we have to be involved in those things that are essential for economy. And that was like a very good example. We, we issued this regulation in 2018, and that made a big difference in the enforcement on uh, the, the environmental requirement, not the national environmental requirement. And now we can, see, we can say that Paraguay developed a, 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 and, 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 and carry and, and really is doing a great work in terms of environmental issues because of this enforcement. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for this. I think it was from Eswatini, right?
Thank you very much. I take this as a comment yeah? and, uh, and not a question. But I know, uh, Aisha, that you are in a rush. And that gives me the opportunity to... We, we have a couple of minutes, more like uh, 12 minutes. Um, so maybe you can give us a short response to a big question here. And this is about the new players, new market entrants. Uh, we have uh, fintechs moving into these markets. There are challenges for regulators. Um, to manage um, emerging risks. And many financial regulators um, uh, are now looking to incorporate technology innovation themselves, actually, into their own systems and processes, including through data analytics, analytics subtech, and CBDCs. Now, CBDCs rings a bell when we, when we talk about Nigeria. So my question is, what are the main financial inclusion use cases regulators are seeking to address with such tools? Are you doing CBDC for financial inclusion purposes? Thank you. That and other things. Um, we're having a side bar just before we came up here about whether, I know that I think what 90 countries or so are either thinking about it or doing some research, and I know it's the buzzword now, but I think it will be different for different jurisdictions in terms of what they want to get out of it. If you have a payment system that is well developed, and if you have financial inclusion at a very high level, for a CBDC to make sense, it has to have an additional use case, or else it's just repeating what is exactly um, already there. I know the general guideline for design principles is that one, it must do no harm, which is to your monetary policy transmission, mechanism to it must coexist with other payment systems. I think that requirement for co coexistence means that CBDCs must do more than just replace or um, be similar to what already exists. For CBN, Central Bank of Nigeria, we see, of course, huge use cases for financial inclusion. Even though we have made a lot of progress since we launched our strategy, we reduced financial exclusion from 58% to 35%. We still have certain areas of the country that are either not connected, but like those in the rural areas, areas that don't have financial access points. We've done a lot to cover that gap with agent networks, but we think we can get more value out of um, offline access, and that is what we're looking at. We did a hackathon recently, and I mentioned it, sorry for those that were at the previous session. I talked about the hackathon that was targeted at the eNaira to look for additional use cases for consumers. And I think that came up very strongly. Other use cases are, of course, enabling payment, but at the micro level, at the rural level, and um, remittances, cross-border payment. These are areas where I think, with the Africa Continental Free Trade um, Agreement, we should start looking at Africa as a trading block, and we need to encourage African trading you know, together. And that means that we need more countries to come out with their CBDCs so we can get interoperability and actually solve the issue of making transfers. I think today, if you want to make a transfer to another African country, you probably have to transfer it to the UK or US before it comes back into Africa. So there's all of those use cases. And also, we need to remember that as we roll this out, you talked about, at one of the sessions, there was discussion about digital mainstreaming and how that excludes people. We need to be conscious of that, even as we roll out our CBDCs, and ensure that we're carrying people along, we're engaging um, the population that we want to get access to this, and we're driving more um, infrastructure, because the whole issue around cloud infrastructure connectivity is a real issue. If the CBDCs are based on mobile phones, and I understand why they're based on mobile phones, if you look at it, even in terms of financial exclusion for Nigeria, there are more people with mobile phones, which means that some of the excluded have mobile phones. So that, of course, is a channel to look at. But then there are many people that don't have this, and we need to actually be very conscious. So lots of use cases for the CBDC. We are very excited to be the first in Africa to bring this out. And there's a lot more that we're going to be rolling out. Thank you. Well, before we uh, have a final round here, I have space for one more there is a one from State Bank of Pakistan. It's there. Oh, you're looking for the microphone, okay. 
if it can be short thanks no. A different, a different monetary policy. Dual, dual, dual. That's a question. Uh, the dual monetary policy for some sectors that are obviously better off, and other sectors that are worse off. Sabine, you are. Passionately shaking your head. I'm so sorry. It depends a little bit what kind of transmission channels and what kind tool of tools you um, use in order to get your, you know, um, your objective on the street. And if you use, for example, like in Europe, the banks, yeah, how do you want to split up these kind of uh, tools? I mean, then you would really do some kind of subsidy uh, tools. Um, which usually are done by the governments, and that would be one of my solutions, yeah? Uh, so if you do have a guarantee, and we did this in Germany, by the way, when we had the unification between Eastern Germany and West Germany, where there were a lot of people needing access to financial services, yeah? They were subsidied, guaranteed by special banks to 70%, and 30% were taken over by the normal banking system, and hence there was the incentive, you know, for them, for the banks, to take over these customers and clients as soon as they would have a positive history, fully, yeah? Um, so, again, I would try to be creative with um, developing, or rather, a government subsidy system, yeah? Then having a dual monetary policy, which I really cannot Right now, imagine how to do this very abstract and very high-level tool so concretely for a certain group of people. But I'm pretty sure Reza will have a solution. I, I wish. Reza, Reza, I'm very sorry. You can share your uh, solution in a sec. Let me uh, try to close this round, yes. and then you will have the floor. You can add in your... Solution. Let's keep in mind that we have seven minutes left, and um, Aisha has to catch a plane. So um, let me ask Maria Fernanda, and very simple, one-minute statement, Maria. What is your main takeaway from this session? Your main takeaway from this session. What do you take home? What have you learned? I oh. learned a lot. <laughs> I think that all the audio now. No, that we think. I think that the, what we kept, what I kept from is that we have to think out of the box. How? And I think that we maintaining our policy mandatory, the payment that is a policy monetary, we also have to see what else we can do about gender, about financial inclusion, and also about our, 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 our main mental issues. So I think that uh, but I, I I'm agree with Sabine that we don't have to lose our mate on the outside. Thank you, Maria Fernanda. Martin, what do you take home to Yerevan from here? What do you take home to Yerevan from here, to Armenia? On a personal level, great interaction with friends. <laughs> Which is, which is probably more important. Um, on a professional thing, I think uh, what Reza formulated in his first statement, that we should probably be innovative and trying to find solutions to tackle several problems that may arise in our way. But also I was, I'm still convinced that our biggest service to our nations is to keep inflation in bay. Thank you. <clears throat> Aisha, what's your takeaway? So I've been infected a little by Sabine and Martin, actually. And that's why it's good to have to talk to people of, on both sides. I think I've, I'm taking away that, you know, the price stability mandate remains paramount. And that even though things are not perfect now, 
we should drive you know, financial inclusion to very high levels, make sure the monetary policy maximum is where it needs to be for us to take our hands away from the areas that you know, we're working on. So you've given me a challenge that we'll keep working on. Thank you so much. Sabine, what is your take, what is the big lesson, if any? Well, first of all, I will try to be less orthodox. <laughs> yeah? um, no, I mean, um, and, and I I'm, I'm, do not mean it as a joke. I'm, I, I'm really, it raised my awareness with regard to the need of financial inclusion and how to be more creative without um, distorting, you know, your main mandate and without being um, in, in, in the risk of losing your independence. And I think we should really use our intellectual capacity, the possibility that we have a strong voice to make risks transparent. And risks can be lying in gender inequality, in inequality, in a lack of financial literacy, in climate change, etc. I think that is, I mean, my awareness was raised quite a lot that, um, I mean, from the European side too, we need to be much more outspoken. Yeah, that doesn't mean you have to do always big measures, you know, risking your uh, financial, your, your independence, but, but rather being very outspoken, voicing, yeah, using your voice. Thank you so much. Uh, Reza, your one minute uh, last input. Thank you. Just very quickly on that last question, I wanted to just say on dual monetary policy. You know, ever since um, central banks began to um, do things such as quantitative easing, you already have many examples of dual monetary policy. For instance, yield, yield curve control is now something being done very actively by many advanced economies, central banks, where they, you know, operate at different points of the curve. This was a cardinal sin beforehand, but it's being done. Second, Federal Reserve of the U.S., I, I, I'm sure the audience knows, has had something called the Main Street Lending Program. I don't know if you, you know, but that was a program where the Federal Reserve was lending directly to SMEs at different interest rates than what are available. So this is already being done, I think, there's a, prol there's a proliferation of the things you're mentioning. But my key takeaways first, learning from Sabine, I will try to be more orthodox. <laughs> second, second, I would say that this discussion, I would try to not characterize it as a discussion between the orthodoxy versus non-orthodoxy or orthodoxy versus activism. To me, it is really a discussion of being orthodox in some areas, such as price stability as something that should not be compromised, but also progressive in some other areas. And the way to do that, to me, is to constantly innovate, to never think that we as central bankers have discovered the true art is nothing more to be done after having declared your primary objective as price stability, but we have to innovate in these areas. Well, thank you so much. Wait. Yeah, we are, we are through. And um, I think this was, uh, as I said, um, uh, and I expected and hoped, um, a very, at least for me, a very exciting uh, discussion. Um, and as I said, um, uh, we might not have a consensus uh, at the end of the day, but the consensus, and I think you all touched upon it, that seems to emerge here is at least following what I heard. You can do many things within your mandate without changing your mandate, right? So I think if that's uh, what we take away at this stage, I would be perfectly happy. And uh, this panel here is a composition that we have never seen before. I mean, these five individuals here have never sat on a panel. I would like, I would like to see this as a teaser. Yeah. And perhaps we have an opportunity sometime down the road to bring the five of them back and discuss again. Thank you so much.
Ladies and gentlemen, can I ask that we also give Dr. Hanig a big round of applause for moderating that session. With those words, we'll excuse the, the panel from the stage, and uh, I draw your attention again to the screen. Ladies and gentlemen, you'll be happy to note that uh, following this evaluation, we will move straight in to our closing ceremony to conclude our formalities and program. So uh, again, we ask if you can please go into the app and complete the GPF evaluation. Let us know what you think about the 2022 Global Policy Forum. In the home page of the app, you'll only need to scroll down and click on Take Survey icon. That'll be coming up on the screen very shortly once we've got our pictures done. But you just need to get to that icon, ladies and gentlemen, where it says Take Survey. Please make sure you have a login as a participant already in the GPF app so that you can provide your feedback. In a moment, we'll also have the closing, official closing of the 2022 Global Policy Forum. So at this time, we ask that you use this to complete the evaluation. Ensure to add the session and complete the evaluation and also the complete evaluation for complete the evaluation for this session and the complete evaluation for the entire forum. As part of the closing ceremony as well, we will be announcing the 2023 GPF host that is coming up very, very shortly. So please don't go anywhere, complete the evaluation, and we're going to get started with the official closing.
Please take your seats. And we invite your attention, please, to the stage. To commence with our formalities, I'd like to firstly invite the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Jordan, Ziad Asad Ganwa, and also Dr. Alfred Hanig, the Executive Director Afi, to please come forward and take their seats up on stage. Let's give them a warm round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, as we come to the conclusion of the 2022 Forum. Thank you so much. Gentlemen, again, ladies and gentlemen, we thank you so much for your attention. This is now the closing ceremony for the 2022 Global Policy Forum. For our closing remarks, I'd like to firstly invite Deputy Governor, Central Bank of Jordan, please put your hands together for Ziad Assad Kanma, ladies and gentlemen. مساء الخير جميعا أصحاب السعادة سيداتي سادتي نيابة عن عطوفة الدكتور عادل الشركس وحافظ البنك الباكس الأردني أود أن أشكركم جميعا على التكرم بتلبية دعوتنا لحضور هذا المنتدى المنتدى السياسات العالمي 2022 هنا في البحر الميت في المملكة الأردنية الهاشمية سواء بالحضور وجاهيا أو المشاركة بالجلسات عن بعد فأنا وسهلا فيكم اسمحوا لي أيضا أن أعرب عن خالص امتناني لجميع مديري الجلسات الحوارية والمشاركين في الجلسات بالإضافة إلى كافة الحضور على مناقشاتهم المثمرة للغاية أثناء الجلسات الخاصة حيث علمت من الزملاء أن مستوى التفاعل كان جيدا أثناء وثريا أثناء الجلسات للمعلومات الغنية خلال يومين الماضيين شاهدنا تبادل للمعرفة والمعلومات حول التأثير غير المسبوق للوباء العالمي والدور الذي يلعبه الشمول المالي في التخفيف من تأثير هذا الوباء على الفقراء وضمان أن يكون التعافي شاملا ومستداما إن شاء الله لقد أتيحت لنا الفرصة للاستماع للقيادات من مؤسسات مختلفة ويؤكدون على الدور الذي تلعبه الابتكارات التكنولوجية وأثرها على توسيع الشمول المالي وتحسين الحياة اليومية للمجتمع نحو التنمية المستدامة والنمو الاقتصادي والحد من الفقر ذلك إلى جانب التحديات وقصص النجاح المرتبطة بإصلاحات السياسات في التكنولوجيا المالية فنتك وتمويل الشركات الصغيرة والمتوسطة والقدرات المالية والبيانات مع التركيز على المساهمات التي تخفف من عدم المساواة الاجتماعية والفقر الأهم من ذلك كله أنه لقد أتيحت لنا الفرصة لمشاركة سياسة الشمول المالي التي انتهجها وأقرها أعضاء تعالف شمال الاجتمال المالي AFI للاستجابة لإدارة أثار وباء كورونا ومنها الخدمات المالية الرقبية DFS Digital Financial Services الوصول إلى الخدمات المالية الأساسية محو الأمية المالية من خلال التوعية والتثقيف كأداة لحماية المستهلك الشراكة بين القطاعين العام والخاص وتوحيد الجهود بين المنظمين ومقدمي الخدمات تعزيز الأمن والمرونة للمدفوعات الرقمية والبنية التحتية للتكنولوجيا وشمول الفئات المستبعدة ماليا لقد جرى خلال يومين العديد من المناقشات الجوهرية حول التمويل الأخضر الشامل وكيف سيعمل التمويل الأخضر على تعزيز الصلة بين الشمول المالي وتغير المناخ ومعالجة لدور المنظمين في بناء المرونة في مواجهة آثار تغير المناخ في تحقيق الأهداف البنية للأهداف التنمية المستدامة الأسدي جيز 17 ومنها الهدف الأول اللي هو القضاء على الفقر والهدف السابع وهو 
الطاقة نظيفة وبأسعار معقولة فذلك الهدف الثالث عشر عن العمل المناخي الكلايمت اكشن بالإضافة إلى تنفيذ اتفاق شرم الشيخ واتفاقية باريس وبعد هذا الحديث نحتاج نحتاج جميعا الآن إلى إعادة النظر في مناهجنا وطرقنا ومناقشة كيف سيكون مسار التعافي أكثر ابتكارا وخضرة واستدامة الحضور الكرام أخيرا مع اقتراب منتدى السياسات العالمية 2022 للانتهاء فأن المهمة التي انتظرنا جميعا ليست بالسهل على الرغم من ذلك فأن مستوى الالتزام الذي تم إظهاره مرة أخرى في هذا المنتدى يشجعنا جميعا على وضع وتنفيذ سياسات وأنظمة ذكية ومتينة في الشمول المالي تؤدي إلى نمو اقتصادي وشامل ومستدام وتشجع الاستقرار المالي وهذا ينبهنا جميعا على ضرورة أن يكون المجتمع العالمي صفقا واحدا للحفاظ على موارده وتحقيق أقصى قدر من التغيير الإيجابي المؤثر للجميع الحضور الكرام اسمحوا لي أن أختتم بتوجيه الشكر لكم جميعا مرة أخرى لوجودكم هنا في بلدنا حيث أن مشاركتكم القيمة والفعالة سمحت لنا خلال هذا المنتدى بالتعمق في مختلف جوانب الشمول المالي. أود أيضا أن أعرب عن خالص تقديري لتحالف الشمول المالي اي اف اي وموظفيه وفريق عمل البنك المركزي اللي ما قصروا أبدا نعطيهم ألف عافية جميعا على الجهود الرائعة المبذولة لإنجاح هذا المنتدى بالشكل الذي يعكس حسن ضيافة الأردن وشعبها. كما أتقدم بالشكر الجزيل لجمعية البنوك العامل في الأردن وعلى كافة البنوك في الأردن على دعمهم لمنتدى السياسات العالمية 2022 كتابا أتمنى لكم جميعا رحلة آمنة للعودة إلى بلادكم ونتطلع إلى رؤيتكم جميعا إن شاء الله في منتدى السياسات العالمية القادم 2023 وندعونا الآن نستمر بنفس الروح والحماس إن شاء الله أعطيكم العافية ومساءكم سعيد Thank you very much, Deputy Governor, Central Bank of Jordan. Ladies and gentlemen, to deliver his closing remarks, the Executive Director of AFI, Dr. Alfred Hennig. Yes, uh, almost over. Sorry for that. Uh, but uh, I think we have seen an um, incredibly exciting uh, Global Policy Forum uh, with all the related events. And mine is actually not so uh, so much uh, going into the forum and the conclusions and all that. I think um, you will find everything uh, nowadays. You know, you don't need people who summarize for you. You you will you will find what you need and what you can take home from this forum. So mine is really more uh, to deliver um, the appreciation in the first place, and then give you a bit of information um, on who was here. Now, first of all. Um, Deputy Governor, thank you so much. Well, we, we are very, very grateful. We are very, very grateful for what the Central Bank of Jordan and the government of Jordan under the patronage of the king has delivered. And um, this is uh, outstanding. I mean, we, we, we have seen these events, and we can say that uh, Jordan is very well placed you know, in the long line of AFI hosts. I think this was great. And the leadership of the central bank really deserves a big thanks for what you have been doing and making possible for us also in terms of resources. Now, there's also the CBJ team. And um, the people who have uh, made this happen is a big team. I can't mention them all, but I would like to thank Mohammed. I'd like to thank Hanin. Yeah. Hanin. Nadia.
and all the others. And uh, we will... Um, we will ask you uh, later to come up uh, when everything is over, but uh, uh, I, have, I would have to ask, uh, Mohammed, is this stage strong enough? <laughs> you checked, yeah? I'm just, you know, just want to be sure. Well, thanks, CBJ team. But there's also a team uh, that has made um, everything happen for us uh, uh, in terms of technology events and um, all, the, all the things that are happening in the background and you don't even see it, but they're super important yeah, that things can work. And this is the ULA events team. ULA events team, and uh, here I would like to at least mention three individuals. Ahmed, <laughs> Tamara, and Hossam. Now, um, I really enjoyed myself also in the hotel, Kempinski Hotel, I need to mention. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's thank uh, special mention to Light, Sulaiman, and Daoud. Daoud. Thanks also for all the people who pushed you, or in modern language we call them ushers. Thank you so much for ushering everyone in and out. <laughs> wow, I think we are getting ready for the party, right? That's great. Thanks for our interpreters. <laughs> AV and technology. <laughs> our MC, Michelle. RP members. RP <laughs> partners. <laughs> and last but not least, the RP team. <laughs> story here, coming back to Nestor Espinilla. We had a DPF in Indonesia, the second one, and uh, I didn't have this list. And someone just before I was supposed to end actually asked me for my pen. So I gave my pen to the person in the crowd, but the person never came back. And while I was preparing there, already on the stage, I couldn't write down all the names. You know what happened? In the closing, I forgot the host. <laughs> I forgot the host. And you can imagine how embarrassing that was. But Nestor came to me <laughs> and said, can happen. <laughs> Don't worry, it will be fine. And he was laughing. But it was very, very embarrassing. So this time, we are more educated and uh, we are further, we have all this. And even teams helped me to do this, so I, I hope I didn't forget anyone. Well, uh, yeah, that was really something. Anyway, um, let me just give you a few numbers. We had four, uh, 53 leaders in total, 
which is 21 from AFI members, right? 20, uh, 53 AFI members um, came with leaders, out of which 21 were female and 32 were male. Yeah, on the AFI side, if I may say so, we're a little bit more advanced in this regard because we had 46 team members, out of which 28 were female and 18 were male. <laughs> then we had AFI technical members, 311. <laughs> and that's quite narrow. 146 female, 165 male. We had one AFI consultant who was a man. <laughs> <laughs> and there are a couple of AFI others, out of which five are female and eight are male. Whatever AFI others mean, but, uh, well, uh, very important people, I'm sh sure, yeah? From the CBJ uh, co-host, we had 59 uh, people working with us. <laughs> Out of which 20 were female and 39 were male. <laughs> From the CBJ stakeholder side, 85, 12 female, 73 male. Partners, 60, 27 female, 33 male. Two potential members, one male, one female. <laughs> what are you doing to me? Okay. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, that's too much, Iliki, that's not fair. Anyway, we had two wives of governors and they were both female. <laughs> Yeah, and then we had Afi others, two females. Anyway, in total, 264 female, 370 male participants, which makes it 634 participants. <laughs> From the membership side, we had uh, six associate and 60 principal members which is really a big number. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, I thank you all, but I wanted to have this uh, um, closing remarks in a different way, so I'm not going to say much. The, the last thing I'm going to say, since we went to this wonderful party, Deputy Governor, last night, uh, the only issue with this party I had um, was actually that it was a little bit warm. And um, that's why we have, when you look into your program, into the app, it says uh, smart casual. Uh, we have dropped the word smart. <laughs> so feel free. Anyway, and it's, the forum is uh, over and uh, we can relax. So please feel free to come um, in, a, in a casual outfit. That's wonderful and perfectly all right. Anyway. My um, last, almost last word before we need to know where we're we going next year, right, um, is actually to ask to do something different. And this is, I wanted to ask two members to come here and do the actual closing remarks. And um, I have just uh, asked two who, who I know a little bit, um, and I felt uh, they might be excited to share a few insights. So there are two of them. One of them is uh, Nom Sebo Hadebe from uh, the Center for Financial Inclusion from Eswatini. And uh, the second one is uh, Samar Hasnan from State Bank of Pakistan. So please, the two of you can come on stage to deliver the closing remarks.
I'm not sure if I have to be formal at this point in time, but I do need to do that. Um, let me recognize the deputy governors that are in this um, forum, the governors present, principal secretaries that are present, um, leadership members that are present, are present here, heads of institution, members of, uh, from all member states, um, the AFI management unit and the AFI team. It's a good afternoon, uh, good evening. But my first one is also to recognize the people that we do what we do for, which is the beneficiaries of our financial inclusion initiatives and recognize them because we do what we do um, for them. As a closing remark, uh, I've actually had the opportunity today to be allowed to do closing remarks and take a reflection of what we've done in the last four days. So obviously we've had the opportunity to meet people that we hadn't seen for two years but could only talk to them and get muted because of technology. But we, we were able to hug them for a change and share what we had done, the experiences we, we have had in the last two years and how emotionally we have gone through a lot of things. But then there was also the other part that while we do what we do, we need to leave a legacy. And that was very key this morning, Dr. Hanning, when we spoke about um, um, Governor Nesta. I recall meeting him in 2016. I think um, we were coming from Fiji, we were sitting on the same aircraft. And he was bubbly. And he was just um, so down to earth. And he was hum uh, so much humility, human centricity that you could see. But he was a leader. And what, has, what does that tell you today? He left a legacy. And he did everything that he did because he had a deliberate intention and action to fulfill while he was still here. It took me back to saying, why am I here? I've had the opportunity to be blessed and work under the guidance of another woman. And what does it tell us as women in this room? We need to raise each other's flags and fix each other's crowns. It further goes on to say, we can do so much if we work together, and we will achieve so much more if we learn to understand, and unity and diversity means just that. We need to understand each other so that we can work together to achieve a common goal. But that doesn't stop there. One of the other things that I've learned over the years, I think I joined the network in 2013, if I'm not mistaken. Eswatini became a principal member of the Ministry of Finance then. And one of the things that I learned, I walked into my first district meeting and I'm like, mm, what are we here to do? And I've learned so much over the years. The changes in leadership that have been in that taught me so much. I am who I am today, if I'm anything, because of the network, because of the leadership that has been going on, the peer learning, the just making friends in the network and understanding why I do what I do because of the working groups and also the people that will work behind the screens to say, do this, do this knowledge product, let's do this, let's do that. We can only do that if we learn to tolerate and work together. It has been that. <clears throat> Interesting, Dr. Hanning thinks I'm young uh, when he looks at me. I turned a certain number this year. <laughs> And I'm starting to believe I'm actually old. I don't know if it's just fatigue, but um, I can't be young when it's convenient, especially if it, I, I have to ask for money from my parents. So this network has actually equipped me to be an independent young woman, but also to realize we have to leave a legacy. There's a team that we need to recognize the youth that were, are going to be the future generation. Um, in one of the sessions this week, we need to realize they're not just the future generation, they're the generation now that we need to prepare and foster for the, uh, for the future. So we have that to do um, as we move forward. Let us give credit where it's due, and this network is doing what it does best, and it's growing year on year. 
like I'm reflecting Dr. Hanning, when I started in 2013, I saw all of you here, and the faces have changed, but one thing has always remained. Financial inclusion is what can drive inclusive economic growth for any country. We must not forget that humility, humility and human centricity will grow this, any economy at any given point in time. As I part ways and go back to my seat, one of the things that I learned in this week is you cannot forget that there are disruptions. They can be in climate, they can be in technology. But we need to learn to coexist and design policies for the now and for the future. And those are my closing remarks on behalf of some of the members. And I wish you all a lovely evening and to see you in the next GPF where Dr. Hanning is going to say. And then, because I'm a lady with a decency, I will allow the gentleman to come here. I have... <laughs> Uh, and alone. Thank you. So, as a matter of fact, you have left nothing for me. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so, I'll start with the thanks to Afi, Central Bank of Jordan, and Afi team here. Uh, I'm not going to some of the things because uh, I'll just be speaking for two minutes or even less than that. What I'll be doing is that I'll be picking, picking up three of my interventions that I did during these two days. And then there is also a suggestion for the AFI. So the first thing, uh, we were one of, the, one of the founding members of AFI. So when I look back uh, in Maya, Riveria Maya, Alfred, when you asked that, uh, anyone wants to make a commitment on financial inclusion, I stood up. I did not have a formal or informal mandate from my governor to make any commitment. But I just, I was so overwhelmed that I stood up and said, it was an emotional sort of a statement I said, uh, I'm sure it would have been recorded somewhere, that I want every financial inclusion to be part of every ordinary citizen of Pakistan. So that was an emotional statement without anything. But today, when, when we look at the figures, that emotional statement has converted into the facts and figures, into the numbers. So when we look at this journey, what AFI has made the difference is conversion of a dream, of a, that, of a person in 2012, into a reality. So that's the first difference that I can see over a period of time. One thing, uh, we, we discussed about climate change and green finance throughout two days. Uh, my fear is that we should have a sense of urgency in that. Climate change is, has hit some countries and, God forbid, is going to hit others. We should develop guidelines, we should develop rules and regulations. 900 pages taxonomy, we were discussing this morning but uh, we'll also take some actions, and probably AFI can play a, a, a pivotal role in, in, in taking those actions. So if other recommendation for the AFI is that if the other working groups are running at a pace of, say, 50 kilometers, that's very slow, but 50 kilometers per hour, probably uh, the working group on green finance, green financial inclusion, should uh, work at double of that 100, 100 kilometers. Therefore we would be able to catch. And last point, again, that's a recommendation and, I mean, a suggestion from our side to the AFI, that, uh, as I was mentioning yesterday, that after COVID, the ability of the central bank and the regulators sitting over here and the government to intervene into flow of financial services to the priority sectors, which are SMEs, women, uh, micro-enterprises, that ability has been limited now. We don't have that sufficient space that was available prior to the start of the COVID. So the problem is that if the governments don't intervene, what would happen of these priority sectors, MSMEs? They would die up. So the suggestion to the AFI, while you have developed a number of uh, Alfred interventions here in AFI, which are the policy intervention, is it the right time to think that the AFI should also be creating a financing arm, an arm which can play a role, say, for example, in providing guarantees to the 
to the SME borrowers, say for example, or the agriculture borrowers who are underprivileged in different jurisdiction. You need to have the funding for that. But I'm sure that there would be a number of partners who would be willing to provide that funding to AFI. The guarantees in the financing arm, and that exactly gels with this concept of IGO, uh, because uh, then you would be having uh, sustainability issue also address. So that's a suggestion that uh, should we be thinking of uh, translating or converting a part of the AFI, a part from the bigger part, a part of the AFI as, as a financing arm. And uh, finally, as I started with an emotional statement, I'll close again on an emo emotional statement. And that statement is that uh, right from the day one when I joined the first meeting, there was a face to the AFI. And today, when I'm, I'm here at the closing ceremony, again, there's the same face of the AFI. And that, that face is Alfred. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Um, well, that's it. Uh, oh no, we forgot something, huh? isn't it? Almost forgot. Of course not. Well, I just wanted to uh, share with you where we are going to be next year. So the next Global Policy Forum 2023 is there. The Bank of Central of Filipinas is most honored to have been chosen to host the Global Policy Forum in 2023. We accept this extraordinary opportunity to demonstrate our collective and relenting commitment to promote financial inclusion across the globe. The BSP is honored to set the stage discussions, exchange of ideas, and insights in collaboration. We are just as keen to share with you the catalytic developments in the Philippines' financial inclusion journey. As host, we are also keen to show the Filipino brand of hospitality and the best we have to offer. Manila, famously known as the Pearl of the Orient, is a place where the past and present meet. It is rich in history and culture. It is also an exciting, dynamic place filled with forgettable sights, sounds, and people. We look forward to seeing you all here in Manila next year. Maraming salamat at pabuhay. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. Please, another big round of applause and congratulations to the team, the Central Bank of Philippines. We have a final piece to do to officially close this year's um, Global Policy Forum. I'd like to invite again the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Jordan to come back on stage, Executive Director of AFI, and also to invite the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Philippines to join us as well. For those who have been part of the ceremonies for um, the Global Forum previously, ladies and gentlemen, we are very familiar with what this means. We're going to, we started everything with the ringing of the gong and we'll close it with ringing of the gong again and handing the gavel to the new host for 2023.
We ask that you bring up the gavel, please, but we invite the Central Bank of uh, Jordan's Deputy Governor to come forward. Yes, please, ma'am, please, if you could just join us on stage. We'd love to have you here for this uh, momentous occasion. Please, let's make a feel wel welcome, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Mrs. Estenilla. For the ringing of the gong, we invite the Deputy Governor of the Central Bank of Jordan. And once that is done, he will hand the gavel to the 2023 host. Well, there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. That marks the end of the 2022 GPF. And the journey now begins for the preparations for the Philippines for 2023. And as we've always done, I'd like to invite the Deputy Governor to come forward, the Philippines, our upcoming host, to say a few words before we conclude our formalities. Dr. Alfred Hanig, Executive Director of the AFI, colleagues and honorable officials of central banks from different parts of the world, private sector partners, and financial inclusion advocates. For the past few days, we gathered here to highlight solutions to financial inclusion goals in the next decade. We thank our host, the Central Bank of Jordan, for the hospitality and support extended to all delegates. On behalf of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas Governor, Philip Medalla, we thank AFI for this wonderful opportunity to host the 2023 Global Policy Forum in Manila. The Philippines has made incredible strides in financial inclusion over the years and it would be a great privilege to celebrate our milestones with this very community that has walked with us in this journey. Hosting the GF GPF has been a long time coming for the Philippines as one of the founding and pioneering members of AFI. The late governor of the Banco Central ng Pilipinas, Nestor Espinilla, had promised to host the GPF before his term ended. He may not be here with us anymore, but we are making good on that promise. The ceremonial gong is not just a symbol of our country's acceptance to host the 2023 Global Policy Forum, but also to allow the message to be heard loudly in the entire world and let it be said. Financial inclusion is here to ensure that everyone will be able to use financial services appropriate to their respective needs and capacity and cut the chain of poverty and income inequality. The Philippine accepts the honor of holding the 2023 Glo Global Policy Forum and would like to extend to all the delegates and visitors the invitation to welcome you in the Philippines next year. We look forward to seeing you all in the Philippines in more than our 7,000 islands. Actually, we have 7,641 islands. And we are waiting for all of you. Maraming salamat at mabuhay po kayong lahat. We thank the two deputy governors, of course, the Deputy Governor of our current host and the future host. We also thank uh, uh, Mrs. Estenia for joining us up on stage and the Executive Director, Afi. Let's give them all a big round of applause, ladies and gentlemen. That will be the final time you hear from me at this year's forum asking you to do that. I just want to close things by saying, don't forget to join us tonight. It is casual. It will be at 7.30, is where we'd like to see you, at the Inner Terrace. 
That's where we're meeting this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, what we've just experienced here this week is a culmination of weeks and months of work. So really, to sum up everything, I draw your attention for the final time to the screen to watch the making of the AFI video. Again, have a blessed journey home, and thank you so much for your attention. Okay. Can I, can I please ask the G, uh, CBJ team, uh, headed by Mohammed, and the AFI team, led by Eliki Boletaba, to the stage for a final photo? Thank you.